right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the City Council meeting for the afternoon of January 23rd. Tony, would you please call the roll? Jimenez? Present. Torres? Present. Cohen? Here. Ortiz? Present. Davis? Here. Duan? <coughs> Present. Candelas? Here. Foley? Here. Batra? Present. Kame? Here. Mahan? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. All right. Now, if you're able, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Today's invocation will be given by President Latanya Hilton and the students of Archbishop Mitty High School. Vice Mayor Kame will tell us more. Thank you so much. Um, Archbishop Mitty High School is a nationally recognized college preparatory academy located in West San Jose in District 1. They opened their doors in 1964 and for 60 years have fostered academic excellence, community service, and spiritual health on and off their campus. Today, we are joined by Latanya Hilton, who grew up in San Jose. She has served as president of Archbishop Mitty since 2021 and is also a proud alumnus. She is joined today by two student leaders, Tevin King, who is a senior who serves on the ASB Media Co Coordinators in Student Government and is a four-year member of the Cross Country Track Team. Anderson Walker is also a senior who serves as a class 2024 senior class president. I am thankful that President Hilton, Tevin, Anderson, and the whole Archbishop Mitty High School community for their service. I am grateful to have them join us at council today and they can come down and I invite them to give their invocation for our council meeting. Good afternoon. Thank you for this special opportunity to speak to you all on behalf of the Monarchs of Archbishop Mitty High School. Um, as Ro uh, Vice Mayor Kamei mentioned, I'm here today as a daughter of San Jose. My parents attended San Jose State University in the 60s when it was Speed City. My mom is a retired educator of Franklin McKinley School District, and I remember town and country before it was Santana Row. I was thrilled to return three years ago to my alma, ma alma mater, shout out to the class in 1992, as its first black female president. And one of my primary goals is to deepen our partnership with the city of San Jose. Over 1,000 current students and their families live in San Jose in and outside of the classroom. We champion neighborhood beautification projects through school-wide service days, promote civic and voter advocacy, and patronize small businesses in District 1 and beyond. Each year, we graduate over 400 students who are intellectually competent, just, faith-filled, and respectful leaders. And ultimately, when these students return to live and work here, just as I chose to do, they do so with a commitment to academic scholarship, service, justice, and embracing those on the margins. What I hold most dear, however, is just how much our students love their school. And today, I'm joined by Tebin and Anderson, who will share more about what MIDI means to them. Tebin? So MIDI for me has always been a place where we are truly invested in each other's success. I definitely see that among my peers and I especially see that when it comes to teachers supporting students. So there was a point last year, for example, when I was knee deep in a science fair project and Mrs. Nguyen, one of our science teachers, came to school at 7.15 in the morning multiple times a week just so she could give me access to the lab facility that I was working in. And beyond academics too, you'll find my calculus teacher in the chapel as a leader for our senior youth group. And one of the best conversations I've ever had was when I asked my AP biology teacher for a college recommendation letter. And he was just genuinely interested in not just my academic interests, but also the kind of person that I want to be in the world. So I would definitely say that MIDI is a place where students are supported, not just in their development as students, but really as whole individuals. For me, MIDI has been a home away from home, not only because I have spent more hours there than I have my actual home, but also because I'm surrounded by a community of people who are as passionate in spirit as I am. Never will you see a 
a women's basketball game who are first in the nation right now um, with a cheering section that has less than 100 people screaming, Go Monarchs! Uh, the spirit goes outside of sporting events as well. We have an event called Monarch Madness that happens on February 29th, uh, which you all are invited to, um, which includes class themes, artwork, dances, games, etc., cetera, um, that really unites us as a school and community. Um, and as I want to close here, I want to thank you so much for your constant support um, with our educators and the students like Tevin and I um, for giving us a, a place where we can truly be ourselves. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you all very much. And go Monarchs. I've never said that before, but <laughs> first for everything. All right, we are on to ceremonial items. Councilman Cohen, please join me at the podium and we will recognize and proclaim International Holocaust Remembrance Day. As we remember the six million victims who lost their lives during the Holocaust and honor the survivors and their descendants, let us also pay tribute to those courageous souls who took direct action to save lives. Their legacy is a testament to the power of empathy and moral courage. They remind us that we too have the capacity to combat hatred in all its forms, to stand up for our neighbors, and to uphold the dignity of all human beings. So yesterday we marked the opening of an exhibit in the lobby of City Hall, a solemn tribute to the righteous among the nations who emerged as beacons of hope during the darkness of the Holocaust. In the face of Nazi persecution, ordinary individuals from diverse backgrounds risked their lives to provide safe passage, shelter, and support to Jewish people in need. As we commemorate the six million victims and honor survivors and their descendants, uh, let's pay homage to these unsung heroes whose bravery serves as, I guess I'm repeating myself, huh? Despite the peril they faced, many heroes assisting the, those fleeing certain death during the Holocaust suffered the ultimate sacrifice facing the death penalty if caught. Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center in Jerusalem, commemorates their courage, honoring nearly 28,000 righteous among the nations on the Avenue of the Righteous, where trees symbolize their personal, personal sacrifices. The exhibit that we have here will remain on display at City Hall through the end of this week. With each passing year, the voices of the Holocaust survivors are becoming fewer, creating a void in first-hand testimonies of resilience and courage. Yet their stories persist through their children who serve as a living link to the past we must never forget. Today, I present our Holocaust Remembrance Day proclamation to Eva Lippmann. Eva was raised in the South Bay along with her two brothers by her parents, Lena and uh, UC uh, uh, Rania, Rania, sorry, who were both immigrants. Her mother was a social worker from Sweden where her father settled after fleeing from, from communist Hungary in 1956. Yussi fulfilled his dream of becoming an engineer and was recruited to work in the nation's Silicon Valley. After nearly a decade, Yussi followed his dream and returned to his roots. Uh, his parents supported their family by owning and running a small family business, the Cookie Jar Bakery. Her dad has learned the bakery trade from, her father, from his father while growing up in Budapest. Ava became a public school teacher and taught both in San Francisco and then Santa Clara County after she and her husband uh, Bruce moved down, to, down here so that their daughter could benefit from being raised near Ava's parents. Their daughter is now a first-year student at UCSB. The Lippmans are members of Congregation Sinai. Ava has been on the Silicon Valley Jewish Community Relations Council for over five years and is a past chair. Once UC Reyna retired, he began to share his experience during the Holocaust, feeling it was particularly important to do so with students. When he got older, Ava would often accompany him in helping uh, students and other groups better understand the family story of survival. Ava's father died in 2020, and she, along with her brothers, helped care for their mother. And her, their, her mother is also here with us today it's in the front row. So Ava, I will give you a moment to say a few remarks. Thank you so much. I'm standing here today because my grandparents took a huge risk and had some truly fortunate events that saved them and their children from the Nazis in 1944, Budapest, Hungary. My dad was nine years old. The Aerocross, the Nazi party in Hungary, implemented many laws against Jews. My dad remembers watching his mother sew on the yellow stars on the family clothing. They were forced to move to Jewish star housing. There was a strict curfew for Jews to be on the street. 
a restrictive Jewish ownership notice was placed on the family bakery business. My dad's uncle, Hugo, who had a good prior relationship with the local police, took a chance to go to the police station to protest the notice. But he was met by a new officer from Berlin who sent him directly to Auschwitz instead. My dad later learned that his first cousins, Paul and Sander, who he loved playing with in the countryside during his summers, had also been sent to the crematorium in Auschwitz. During the small window of time that the Jews were allowed on the streets, Papitska and Mamitska, my grandparents, were checking on their bakery, which they had entrusted to non-Jewish managers. Little did my dad know they were also preparing a hiding place above the bakery. Yes, this was similar to Anne Frank's story. Incidentally, my husband and I have been streaming the show A Small Light. It tells the Frank story from Meep's perspective, the hero who did the right thing to help. We highly recommend it. My dad's family was discovered after two months in hiding and taken to Aerocross headquarters. This was some of the most terrifying times for my dad. The Aerocross was shooting most Jews into the Danube River at this point. As a result of another life-saving turn of events, my dad's family was sent to the Jewish ghetto instead. As they entered the ghetto, my dad saw frozen bodies stacked up against the synagogue. Another fortunate life-saving event led them to the home of a relative in the ghetto, where they managed to survive the remaining several months of the war with little food in very cramped conditions huddled up in a single bed most of the time. My dad's experience has many more details that we don't have time for today, but I greatly appreciate the city, San Jose City Council for remembering the six million murdered Jews and the survivors who experienced so much trauma yet demonstrated such incredible resiliency. We are also very thankful to the Jewish Family S Services of Silicon Valley for the help they provide today for our local survivors. Thank you so much, Ava, for sharing your family's story. Um, now, Mayor Mahan and I are going to present a proclamation to Ava Lippmann in um, recognition of International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And if you have a chance before you leave or during the week, stop in the lobby of City Hall to check out the exhibit about the righteous among the nations. Councilmember Batra, please join me here at the podium and we will recognize the Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement Department. I'm Arjun Batra, council member for District 10. This is still okay. All right, all right. I think it's working. <laughs> okay. Mayor, council members, and fellow residents, I have the immense pleasure of giving a commendation to a very hardworking, dedicated professionals of the city's planning department. When I came into the office in my both informal social events and formal events with the community, I got complaints about this department, that our city's department of planning, getting a permit, is almost asking God to do something new for you in this world because it took a year and a half to get a simple remodeling permit. Working with this group for last, as soon as I came in, the city launched a program in July 
called the best designer program, best prepared designer program, which to the disbelief of most of the residents of San Jose, that you can get a renovation remodeling permit in three to five business days. Many people could not believe it, but it has happened. Today, there are 120 professionals recruited in this program where they can prepare a renovation remodel program. City doesn't do any duplicate work, doesn't spend any time in the planning department to review, but we still have a code compliant design which the city is able to make sure will meet the structural requirements because this has been produced by the proper, the uh, educated, licensed professionals. So innovation of this kind, where we did hire a hundred more people to go and do this work. In this case, we are able to take the time away and the slowness of being able to get the contractors to work. We have been able to get this thing done because of the innovative process which this department developed and launched in July. We are able to handle now many, many more projects straight from the designers coming in and moving on to the building permit and starting the construction. So it's helpful to the economy, it's helpful to the resident, and also it frees the time of our professionals to work on the bigger development projects which need their attention. So I'm really thankful to this group and I commend them for their activity that this is the kind of innovation we need that we should be able to make the city more efficient, serve our communities faster with better services. So Chris and your team. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for all what you have done and I'm looking forward to the more developments you are going to come up with which are going to improve even the development process and more of the development projects are going to go through quicker and faster. My name is Bill Main, Division Manager of Building Division. Uh, I am honored and humbled uh, to accept this accommodation on behalf of the PBCE Building Division for the Best Prepared Designer Program. We started it out uh, in July. We have over 120 uh, designers that are registered into the program now to fast track to get into the field and start their construction. We would like to thank Council Member Bartra, all of the council members, the mayor, city manager for this accommodation. With the vision of PBC as a professionally run organization, we look forward to watching this program grow with much success. Thank you again, and we appreciate your time. Congratulations on the commendation. Thanks for the innovative program. We really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. Bill. Thank you guys for the work. We appreciate the innovation. Go ahead and sit in here. All right. Let me get this out of the way. Councilmember Dewan, please join me at the podium and we will recognize the Kamai Kampuchea Krom Veterans Chapter in San Jose. I'd like to invite the members of the community to come on down. Please, come join us. All right. All yours. Thank you. I'll wait until the... everyone done? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Today, it is an honor to present a commendation to the Khmer Kampuchea Krom Federation in Chapter in San Jose. 
This commendation is a testament to their resilience, cultural richness, and unwavering dedication to our community. The Khmer Krom, an indigenous group spread across Southeast Asia, have faced numerous challenges in their pursuit of rights and autonomy, especially under the communist regime in South Vietnam, Southern Vietnam. Here in San Jose, we are fortunate to have a thriving Khmer Krom community boasting two temples and vibrant youth groups. This commendation also recognize their active roles in advocating for a space to practice their Buddhist religion and their pivotal contribution to the, to the development of our city. We express our gratitude to Nari Brandenburg, the Khmer Krom community representative, and six esteemed monks, Venerable Sovana Narit, Venerable Ratana Young, Venerable Sanal Tat, Venerable Tai Tien, and Venerable Tai Tat, and last is Venerable Savi Yim. The Khmer Kampuchea Krom Federation chapter in San Jose has played crucial role in bringing community together, preserving cultural and fostering peace and unity in our community. With this, I would like the mayor to give a commendation and we extend our heartfelt appreciation for their enduring efforts. Let us celebrate the Khmer Kampuchea Krom Federation chapter for their contribution to our city and cultural tapestry. Thank you. And at this point, uh, Mayor, would you give the commendation? Thank you. And at this point, I would like Leslie Godino to come up and make a speech upon the behalf of Khmer Krom Federation. And would you like to say that? Thank you, council member, very much. And on behalf of Chris and Lena, who couldn't be here today, um, I offer our thanks as well. And thank you to the mayor and to council member Candelas and to all the council members for allowing this community to build a beautiful new temple here in San Jose. Uh, the last time we were here, it was such an important day, and one of the monks commented that this place is always going to be very special for them since you approved that temple. So thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Neri Prudenberg, and I am the Khmer Kampuchea Crown Federation Chapter's President in San Jose. I stand here today with a heart full of gratitude and appreciation as we gather to extend our deepest thanks to Mr. Max Mahan and the San Jose City Consultant and staff. Your accommodation to the Khmer Krom Indigenous People communities living in our beloved city is an honor, and we are proudly grateful for your recognition. The Khmer Krom community ori originates from the Mekong Delta, known as Kampuchea Krom. We follow Buddhism and hold our traditions close to our hearts. In 1975, those two the communists take over us in Vietnam, the Khmer Krom people faced the difficult decision to leave our homes. This led us to different parts of the world, including here in San Jose, where we have built a supportive and tight-knit community. So that we are a small group. Our dedication to our cultural heritage is immense. We strive to keep our costume, language, and religious practice vibrant and alive. Our communities, center, and temple as the pillars of our communities. They are not just place for worship, but also center for teaching our language, celebration our culture, and hosting community events. 
This space are we dolls for keeping our traditions thriving and connecting us to our roots. In addition to cultural activities, our temple also engage with the wild San Jose community. It serves as a meeting place for neighborhood discuss discussions and as a polling station during elections. This shows our commitment to being an active part of our civic life of San Jose. We believe it's important that our community voice is included and heard in broader conversations of our city. We want to express our sincere gratitude to Mayor Mat Mahan and the City Council for acknowledging the Khmer Krom Indigenous People communities. As our communities continue to grow and integrate, we are excited about the opportunity to contribute even more to this wonderful city. Our goal is to foster understanding among different cultures, enrich the diversity of San Jose, and positively impacts the communities. Together, we look forward to building an even stronger and more inclusive San Jose for, gener for generations to come. Thank you. Akon. All right, we are on to orders of the day. Does anyone on the council have any changes to the printed agenda? Okay, not seeing any. Move on to adjournment. This meeting will be adjourned in honor and memory of Carolyn Elsie, a devoted member of the Iola Williams Senior Program for 22 years. Council Member Dewan will tell us more. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon. First, and foremost, my deepest condolences go to the family and friends of Caroline Elsie, a steward member of the Lola Williams Senior Program for an impressive 22 years. Caroline's unwavering commitment extend beyond mere participation. She served as a treasurer, secretary, bingo committee member, and program event coordinator at the Lola Williams Senior Center Executive Advisory Board for much of her tenure. She received well-deserved recognition from the San Jose Junior League for her outstanding volunteer efforts. Carolyn went above and beyond providing coffee and even funding Thanksgiving turkey for senior in need. Carolyn's impact reached far beyond the confines of the seniors program. She collaborated closely with Council District 7 and San Jose Park and Recreation, tirelessly advocating to maximize senior access to the city resources. Always ready to volunteer for any task. Carolyn played a pivotal role in ensuring the success of the center programs. 
catering to the diverse needs of her fellow seniors. Her warmth, humor, and kind spirit will be sorely missed at the center and throughout our community. Today, as we reflect on Carolyn's legacy, let us all acknowledge the profound loss we feel and express our gratitudes for the indelible mark she left on our, in our hearts and the community she served so selflessly. Thank you, and I would like to do, introduce Stephen Gillian to speak. Thank you. I would like to thank Mayor Mark Mahan and the city council members uh, for this recognition and proclamation in her memory. Um, my mom, our mom, um, Carolyn moved to San Jose back in 1962 uh, with her mother and her siblings. Um, she started a family here and um, was an active community member from her arrival. Um, she was involved in and supported several civic uh, community organizations, which she served in many leadership positions uh, and received numerous awards for her service uh, until her passing. Some of these organizations include uh, Garden City Women's Club of San Jose, the CSA CWC Operation Share Food Ministry, NAACP, Eastside Ladies in Action, Red Hatters, Inez C. Jackson Club and Library, the Iola Williams Senior Center, uh, TWIS, AACSA, Archie's Ar Army, she was a True Vine Baptist Church founding member and um, uh, involved in the MD2C organization. In her community, she was instrumental in writing books like Black Americans in Santa Clara Valley, which is a historical compendium of uh, the history of black people and their contribution to the valley and its inception. Uh, True Vine Missionaries Cookbook, she helped in several elections for mayor and city council members and other officials. Um, she was also very active in uh, elections and polling and uh, uh, a volunteer down at the polling uh, stations and so she did her duty in that regard as well. Um, again, I would like to thank the mayor and the city council for this um, honor and um, um, that's it, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing your mother's story with us and we're very sorry for your loss. Thank you, thank appreciate you. that. Absolutely. We are on to the closed session report, Nora. Thank you, Mayor. We do not have a report out of closed session today. Thank you, Nora. Next is the consent calendar. I understand that members of the council would like to pull items 2.7, 211, and I'm sorry, 210 and 211. Are there any other items that council would like to pull? Okay. So we will go in order, and Councilor Torres, I had you for item 2.7 first. Great, uh, thank you, Mayor. I wanna thank PRNS and Public Works for bringing this item to our council. Our North San Pedro community has been looking forward to these sites. Continue to be moved forward. Um, by being interconnected with Pelier Park in downtown. So we are getting more than a few parks in downtown San Jose, and we're very excited. I'm excited to see this timeline for construction is set for mid-2024. But most importantly, most importantly, uh, some of the members are leaving, but <laughs> that's all right. Uh, most, importantly, I, I, most importantly, I'm honored to have this park in the city be named after an amazing black woman named Elizabeth Boyer, who founded Garden City Women's Club. 
uh, in our city is very important to honor the contributions of our black community in San Jose and naming, naming this park does just that. And I know she just exited the, the, the chambers, but it's great to see Helen Sims and other members of the Garden City uh, Club here today, but they just left, but that's okay. But uh, we're naming a park after an amazing community leader, so thank you. Great, thank you for those comments, Council Member. Councilor Candelos, would you like to speak on item 2.10? Uh, yes, um, thank you, Mayor. Uh, you know, I, I just want to start off by thanking uh, staff uh, for bringing this item forward to, to council today. I know in early December, uh, the Legislative Analyst Office projected a, a major California deficit uh, anticipated in the coming fiscal year. And so as soon as I heard, um, I immediately reached out to our Intergovernmental Relations Office to express some urgency uh, in helping to secure the funding allocation. Um, I know, although Governor Newsom released his, his January budget and it was a lot rosier than the $60 billion shortfall projected, um, I know we still need to act swiftly to, to ensure that this crucial earmark for Lake Cunningham comes to fruition. Uh, with this funding, uh, we're going to start seeing some changes at this park and we're gonna, it's going to allow us to make a dent um, on the water quality issues uh, plaguing the park. Um, our community is relying on us to secure these funding sources and, and, and get to work. Um, given the looming statewide budget shortfall, there's a risk of having these funds clawed back, albeit minor, um, from my conversations with staff, um, but you know, it's still a risk. And so uh, I have full confidence in the commitment and capabilities of our staff in helping secure these fundings, uh, th this funding and having it actually on hand um, because I know, um, and a lot of us here on the dais know that our East San Jose families uh, are depending on it. So I uh, just wanted to quickly comment on that. Thank you. Thanks, Councilmember. Appreciate those comments. Councilmember Ortiz, would you like to speak on item 2.11? Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. And first off, I just want to thank uh, the administration and staff for taking swift action in regards to this emergency request from Amigos that provides direct services and housing um, to many of our immigrant communities um, in Eastside San Jose. Um, I wanted to um, just pull the item to see one, I'd like to call, I don't know if Angel Rios is here. I, I saw him earlier. Oh, uh, hey, Angel. Looks like he's there. If you could come on down. Just one, wanted to ask you a quick question. So um, uh, as you know, Angel, people reached out to, to me. They were concerned um, that on paper, it looks like we're taking money out of the rapid response. Uh, network, which is also a vital resource to our immigrant community. I wanted to just make sure that we could direct staff to replenish those dollars as we utilize this, uh, you know, respond to this emergency for immigrant members of our community. Yeah, it, Angel Rios, Deputy City Manager, and, and that is correct. Uh, we, we, we have identified this source of fund because the rapid response funds is exactly for this type of use, right? Mm -hmm. We also know that there's a whole network of organizations that also provide the service. So our intent would be to, uh, you know, based on this direction, <clears throat> if we go back and replenish that fund. So meet the immediate need and then replenish the fund uh, more midterm. Okay, would we need to pull that for a separate action, Mayor or City Manager? Would you need direction in the budget process to do that or do you have another way of doing that? I don't think we need additional direction, Jennifer McGuire, City Manager. You know, and we do get the. Th this is part of our base budget every year. So there's new. There are also are new funds that come every July one. So there is a, a, a there is a an automatic replenishment for this fiscal year. We don't have an executed contract yet, and I know we're working on that. And to the extent we can get one executed, we will uh, we will replenish the funds. Okay, so it's the administration's uh, stance that we will replenish the funds. Thank you. Yes, that's correct. I guess I'd like to move the... Would you like to move the consent calendar as a yep, whole? the consent calendar as a whole. Second. Great. Second from Councilmember Condellas. Appreciate that. Uh, let's go to public comment on the consent calendar. I have Norma, Jose, and Stephanie here in person. Again, that's Norma for 2.7, Jose, and Stephanie for 2.11. And then I have speakers online as well. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Stephanie Jane. I'm speaking on consent item 211. 
I'm the Director of Social Impact and Sustainability at Amigos de Guadalupe Center for Justice and Empowerment. I'm here representing our Executive Director, Maritza Maldonado, who's at the County Supervisors meeting right now discussing the same family homelessness issue that I'm here to speak with you all about. So we want to thank you, Mayor, um, for your commitment to the housing and homelessness crisis and for your respons responsiveness to our urgent concerns. And also thanks to Councilmember Ortiz and Vice Mayor Kamei for taking the time to speak with Maritza. As we described in a communication to City Council last week, Amigos has been serving hundreds of parents and children who arrive at our agency desperate, with no place to live. Many of these families are seeking asylum and come with extraordinary trauma and are among the most vulnerable here. We give them emergency housing at hotels, provide case management, immigration legal support, and help getting their children enrolled in school, as well as emergency food and clothing. We connect them to a supportive community and we help them transition to self-sufficiency. Unfortunately, we've run out of funding to pay for the hotels and these critical services, so we appreciate the proposed $150,000 that is on today's consent calendar. This will cover half of our expenses through January, with the understanding that the county will cover the other half, hopefully approved at, the meeting, at their meeting this afternoon as well. As was just described, we were very concerned about the funding source of the Rapid Response Network, um, but we are grateful that that will be corrected, so thank you for that. We want to make clear now, as we have been, that this does not come anywhere close to actually addressing the full problem. It addresses the problem for about two weeks, and then the families and we will be in the exact same situation again. Unless there's a more adequate solution in place by your February 6th council meeting, we will have no choice but to begin the process of moving family. Thank you, next speaker. Good afternoon, my name is Jose Murillo, the director of place-based initiatives at Amigos de Guadalupe. Dedicated to lifting families out of poverty and building community where every child can prosper. Picking up where my colleague Stephanie left off, as you heard from our email last week, here's what we need from the city. We've asked you and the county to split the housing costs for the 65 families for the next five months until the end of June, and that each entity paid the hotels directly because we're not able to do so uh, to front the cost. We need this commitment from the city and the county by February 6th in order to avoid having to put families out on the street in the winter. So we will see you here with, as much, with a much larger group at your meeting on February 6th. We're praying that you'll put together an adequate plan by then to prevent this great tragedy from happening. Because these children have experienced things that no child should experience. They've seen things that no child should ever have to see. And yet amidst this great adversity, they found hope in the thought of living in this amazing city, in our city. And to extinguish their dreams now would be to dim the light of this city's future. So I think I, I wanna ask you all, when these children grow up, how will they remember us? A place that throws our children out on the street or a place where they can live and shine brighter than ever before? Thank you. Okay, moving on to online speakers, I start with Paul Soto. Uh, thank you, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I want to talk about uh, item 2.8. Um, in 1938, eight months before the redlining document that we're all very familiar with um, that uh, surfaced and really started the segregation that has happened and still is continuing to happen here in San Jose, um, then it was along racial lines. Now it's economic. But that document was ratified eight months after Willow Glen incorporated itself and was annexed back into San Jose. See, Willow Glen couldn't handle it, it on its own. They were a city from 1927 till 1938, eight months before that redlining map was created. Now that, that's setting the premise for what I'm about to say, is that 
This is one of the most racist areas in the city. They've got plenty of money that they acquired from those racist policies. Now they got this cozy deal with the city. They don't need any more money. You have citizens now in this city that are still contending with the generational impacts of that red line. So it's a very, it's, it's disgusting for Willow Glen to sit there with a straight face and act like they need this deal with the city for more services. Haven't you had enough? I mean, I mean, I mean, how much more do we have to continue to like allow this kind of racist policies to continue to infect? And it is, it's an infection. Racism is an infection. Dr. Sarah Cody said it explicitly. Racism is a public health issue. So those racist policies created a public health issue. And I'm really sick of this economic uh, connection that the city has with the Scott? Yeah, I'd like to speak on item 2.11, the, the asylum seeking. Um, yeah, so every single aspect of mass immigration is Jewish. You can go to GTV Flyers. That is not city business. I'm sorry, I need to speak on city business. Thank you, Matt. You like your postcards? Sorry, that's not city business. Sorry, in person. Hi, Council and Mayor. Um, I want to speak on the 2.10, the grant for 1.5 million request from Natural Resources Agency. Um, that's a lot of money. Um, our city council member approved uh, a Buddhist temple from a billionaire. So I don't see why we need to ask anyone else for money. You should be able to ask him for money. Thanks. Back to council. Okay, thank you. It's in your hands. I think we are ready to vote. Motion passes unanimously. Great. Thank you, Tony. Okay, we are on to item 8.1, establishment of a pedestrian mall on North San Pedro Street. This is a public hearing. I'm gonna read a brief script to open the hearing. This is a public hearing to consider the establishment of a pedestrian mall on North San Pedro Street between West Santa Clara Street and West St. John Street pursuant to the Pedestrian Mall Act law, I'm sorry, Pedestrian Mall Law of 1960. The public hearing is now open. We will now hear from any person who wishes to speak about the proposed pedestrian mall. Does anyone wish to speak? Yes, I have several speaker cards. Um, Randy, Mike, and when I say your name, please come on down. First person on the microphone can start speaking. You don't have to speak in the same order you're called. Um, Randy, Mike, Alex, David, and John. And please say your name um, just so I know who you are. Uh, Randy Muster. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Mahan and City Council members for allowing me to speak today. Again, my name is Randy Muster, owner of su uh, seven Sushi Confidential locations here in the Bay Area. Today I stand before you as a representative of the downtown San Jose business community, particularly those that have faced the unique challenges posed by the post can uh, COVID landscape. Downtown San Jose, once vibrant and bustling, has encountered obstacles ranging from safety concerns to the diminishing presence of companies and employees. In the face of adversity, there emerged a glimmer of hope during the pandemic by temporarily closing San Pedro Street to vehicular traffic. This intervention allowed restaurants like ours to expand into the streets, offering a lifeline to struggling businesses. The ability to extend our footprint onto the sidewalks free from disruptive traffic not only ensured our survival, but also helped in creating a safe, vibrant community uh, atmosphere in the heart of downtown. As we strive towards recovery, I urge the City Council to consider the tremendous impact that 
the pedestrianization of San Pedro Street has had on local businesses. However, the journey towards revitalization is incomplete without a committed financial plan to develop San Pedro Street into a true pedestrian haven. San Pedro Street has the potential to be unlike any others in the South Bay. The community feel, the safety, and the unique atmosphere we fostered through these challenging times can be the foundation for a thriving entertainment district. I implore the City Council to continue with the vision of making San Pedro Street a permanent pedestrian-only space. Let us work together to build a downtown that not only recovers but flourishes, becoming a beacon for residents and visitors. Thank you. Next speaker. Honorable Mayor and members of Council, my name is Alex Satinsky. I'm the CEO of the San Jose Downtown Association, and I'm here today to support the closure of San Pedro Square, um, San Pedro Street to vehicular traffic. I want to thank Council um, and City staff for their work, uh, first of all, uh, to getting us to this point where we are now. This has been a long time coming. From the earliest pilots, um, captained by council member Perales to the desperately needed closures during COVID lockdown, as you all remember, to the current state of affairs with restaurants taking expanded sidewalk space returning the street to, pede to pedestrians in a potentially exciting way. The San Jose Downtown Association has been involved in and supportive of all of these iterations of the closure and has used our platform to convene many of the key stakeholder meetings as these decisions have been made. San Pedro is one of the most unique streets downtown has, and we have invested in its future for years, more notably with the opening of the Moment Shops uh, in 2018. We are excited for the future of this project and would like to see a realistic timeline uh, and budget for future beautification efforts uh, emerge from this process. Um, there are a few other streets in downtown that may also be suitable um, for the Pedestrian Mall Act and we're eager to work with staff on identifying these opportunities to make downtown more friendly uh, to users of all ages and abilities. I want to thank you for your time. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker. Afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Thanks for letting me speak. My name is Mike Messenger owner of a few properties on San Pedro at Santa Clara and a few businesses. And just like what Randy and Alex said, I'm in full support of the Pedestrian Mall Act passing and I really appreciate the efforts Blog and the team has done to uh, get to this far. Uh, just a few comments, they said that all basically, but as a running the business there, a few more things to keep in mind. Uh, first off, that First impressions are, are very important, and I do worry about if we just do semi facelift to this thing, it won't do the impression that it really needs to, needs to be to make this a very a vibrant street. So I do urge that you really look at the funding. That hopefully, uh, I know you might be looking at landlords like me, but other member, other places to get some funding to make it at least do what they said of the painting of the street or mural on the streets, the lighting and landscaping. But if you do a little bit more, it would be great for the block. It needs a little more pizzazz than where it is right now. Second, also running with my Blanca, uh, Blanco um, urban venue, we did 106 events on there uh, this last year, and we didn't have any issues with deliveries. And I know you have mentioned there that you have deliveries with uh, between before before 10 o'clock. I don't know if you really need that or not. You know, running the restaurants there and there, they've never had an issue with deliveries. I think it might be a little bit cumbersome to have trucks come in there and trying to figure out what people walking down to coffee in the morning have trucks going in and out and they will be confused when they can go or not go. So I do question if you really need that or not. Um, this, you know, this look into a little bit more, I feel as running it, it's not needed. And just thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. My name is John Burroughs. I'm the operations manager at San Pedro Square Market. Um, I'm here today, today in support of the closure of San Pedro Street to vehicular traffic. The San Pedro Square Market is a major driver of foot traffic in the area. 
and home to over 20 individual small business merchants. In addition to our local guests, we are a popular starting point for out-of-town guests as they explore downtown San Jose. Um, while the Pedestrian Mall Act process is underway, uh, we'd like to see, improve, see further development of the city's plans for the street, including safety and beautification improvements. Uh, San Pedro has always been a special street, a unique public place, and now there needs to be a significant investment in its future. A um, couple key points uh, would be having um, good lighting, um, both for the uh, for public safety, but also just the beautification and attracting um, guests to the area. Um, we also want to ensure that adequate parking for uh, guests and for events be maintained in per perpetuity. Uh, and we also want to acknowledge that the, any amount of closure time for uh, a project um, of the scope uh, does have negative uh, impacts on the businesses in the area. Businesses in the area, so we'd be looking to mi minimize that time of disruption. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the council and city staff again for their hard work uh, on getting us to this point. Um, we look forward to anchoring uh, our end of the block for a long time, and for uh, with our small business partners, giving San Jose a. a a true dining and, down and, and entertainment destination all year round. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. I have David. Okay, I'm going to move on to the in person, uh, the virtual speakers. Um, Paul followed by Levi. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. No, 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 no. I'm sick and tired. Would somebody please tell ex-Mayor McHenry that I'm sick and tired of him using, uh, leveraging his power with this council in order to look at the city coffers like they're his personal piggy bank? Because this, this is probably ground zero for racism in the state of California. It's two blocks away from where Thomas Fallon, whose house this city spent $6 million on. Do you guys remember that? six million dollars on this dude who i had to take this dude's statue down i had to go through all of that work to take that dude's statue down now i'd like to take his house down but you know it's a landmark remember so this area is probably one of the most racist areas let me put it in these terms it's the same thing as trying to build housing near auschwitz or like, let's, let's improve the area near Auschwitz where the, where the Holocaust had started. Well, this dude is a profiteer from the American Holocaust that happened here in San Jose. His house is right there on the property of this area. People, people think about what you're doing because this is gonna cost $10 million. There was already an assessment made. And by the time that we get done with it, but by, by the time it comes time to really actually do something like this, it's going to go up to at least $15 million. And this money is going to come out of the city coffers in order to do that. No, absolutely not. Because not. And another thing, Tom McHenry shaved off a portion of the adobe house that belongs to Jose Manuel Gonzalez. In order for him for this progress, he shaved off a portion of that house. It's disgusting what this dude is doing, and now he's trying to do this move? Levi, followed by virtual protest. The hollow hoax was an anti-white lie. Never happened. That is not city business. Thanks, Matt. Sorry, you need to you. focus on the item that we're discussing. I love you, Matt. That is not city business. <laughs> yeah, it is. OK, virtual protest. Hello? Go ahead. Okay, thank you for uh, taking my call. Um, in response to uh, the condition of the pedestrian uh, safety, regardless of whether it goes through um, funding approval or not, it is um, really unsafe. There's a lot of leads. I don't know if anyone's noticed. Um, I did talk to some of the business owners that were there about who takes care of their walkways um, in front of the business, there was one um, taqueria that looked really great. They had taken care of their walkway, it was safe, and in front of their store. But all of the rest of the stores, I'm not sure if they are relying on the city to clean up in front of their store, the leaves. Um, but when they get wet, they get slippery and dangerous. Um, and if it's going to be pedestrian only, 
you're not going to have street sweepers going through there, uh, I'm assuming. Um, I, I'm not sure. And I think that each business, um, I'm not sure if they're independently taking care of these things, riding your bike through there, scooters, uh, bike lanes, you know, it's, it, it's kind of confusing on what a person should do. Uh, and stay to the right, stay to the left, stay to the middle. Um, and who's going to clean up after the leaks? So I think um, that needs to be addressed. Uh, and each business, I, I would hope, would contribute to that street. Um, and I, I think that it's really important to make sure that our streets are clear of leaks and our gutters and our storm drains are clear. Thank you. Back to council. Okay, thank you, Tony. Were any written comments, claims, objections, or protests on the proposed pedestrian mall received by the city clerk prior to this hearing? No. Okay, thank you. The public hearing is now closed. We will turn to the council for discussion. Uh, I want to thank Councilor Torres for uh, being a, a champion for this street closure, and we'll turn to him in just a moment to make a few comments. I did want to just initially, as we kick off here, ask just a few informational questions of Blage, and then I'd like Councilor Torres to share his perspective. Blage, really appreciate your work on this. Um, I, I know as we look to make our downtown more vibrant and think about uh, how we uh, may facilitate more public space for pedestrians and cyclists and support our, our storefronts at the ground level, uh, it will require funding. How can the council help you in both the short and long term secure funding for these kinds of street closures and expansion of public space? Um, thank you, Mayor Blagis Lalich, uh, Deputy Director for the Office of Economic Development. Uh, with respect specifically to San Pedro, staff has been having uh, a variety of different conversations about how uh, we might be able to do some incremental improvements on the street uh, once the pedestrianization uh, is actually approved by council. And so, um, as you will recall, back in uh, October, there was an initial estimate that staff put together that was really a complete revamp of the street. It, was, it had to do with infrastru infrastructure um, upgrades and improvements, um, creating a flush condition. It, it was pretty substantial. Um, and so one of the things that we did hear from the businesses is that they were very concerned about the disruption to uh, businesses on the street and what a huge overhaul might do. Um, in terms of causing disruption. And so we've been looking for um, keeping our eye out for kind of smaller opportunities for funding, whether that's through public-private partnerships uh, to do some enhanced safety and beautification methods. But we haven't gone kind of full bore on that because the first step was really to do this process, which was officially removing the vehicular traffic uh, from the street on a regular basis. Okay, thanks for that. For that first phase of improvements, do you have any sense of scope and timing? Well, currently we don't have any sort of funding officially identified um, in terms of what kind of the thought has been uh, is that it's likely, again, the minute you say a number, it, it might get larger, um, but initial estimates is probably about 450000 that could um, be used towards uh, a street mural, so actually making it look like a fun place, not a, a former street with the yellow line down the middle, um, and then also um, removable bollards. So currently we have traffic safety equipment both at the north and the south end of the street. They're, they're not the prettiest things you've ever seen. And so doing um, something that's a little, enhances the beautification, but um, also uh, maintains the safety those would be the first two items. Great, thank you. Two more just very quick questions. As, as you heard from a couple of the business owners, there are concerns about potential disruptions to their business as improvements are made. What is your plan for communicating with the property owners and small business owners there and keeping the District 3 office and my office ideally in the loop on those conversations? 
Yeah, we would continue to communicate the way that we have been communicating, uh, which is directly with both your office and the council member's office, uh, directly with many of the property owners and businesses on the street, through the Downtown Association and their San Pedro Square Committee. Uh, so the, the great part is that we enjoy really good relationships with folks on the street um, and are able to communicate with them uh, right. very quickly. Great. And often. I'm glad to hear that. And I assume tentative plans would be communicated early enough for feedback and potential adjustment. Is that fair to say? Correct. Okay, great. And then finally, do you anticipate, I hope this would be the case, that there might be a reduced cost for special events to occur on that street given that there would not need to be an actual street closure to initiate them? Seems like that would mean that there would maybe be less work and less cost required uh, if the street were to be cl permanently closed? Is that uh, something that you're looking at? So it's fair to say that because the street is already closed, there wouldn't need to be a street closure permit, um, but there are other permits that are obviously go along with planning a special event. We do have a pilot. Um, I think that you're, you're well aware the Office of Cultural Affairs did bring forward a pilot program that had kind of a smaller footprint event that met certain criteria and parameters uh, that that didn't have as much um, permitting as as much of a permitting requirement around it and so that is still in place um, and so I think basically what we would be doing uh, is what we always do which is engaging our office of cultural affairs the special events team they would work with the event producer and um, identify the different um, permits that would or wouldn't need, be needed for any event on San Pedro. Okay, but at least the cost of street closure would no longer be relevant. Okay, Correct. that's good to hear. All right, I want to turn it over to Councilor Torres and just thank him once again for championing this street closure and the work with the small businesses there at San Pedro. Council member? Great. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you uh, to our city staff and, uh, of course, other stakeholders for, for making this happen. And my, my one question I do have before I, I give uh, some other remarks, uh, do we host, does the city host our own meetings with our, with our small businesses in San Pedro or do we piggyback, piggyback with another organization? Uh, we've done both. both. So we have, um, we've gone through the Downtown Association and gone to their San Pedro Square Committee uh, and we have also sent messages through the Downtown Association and hosted kind of our own meeting. Great. Uh, that's uh, extremely important, right? Because I know that when we propose something major in the city of San Jose, there are times when our community or our business community feels left out. And so my team, and even before becoming council member, I was sitting in these meetings working for for San Jose Downtown Association. So, so I'm very glad that we are working with the San Jose Downtown Association, along with our other merchants on San Pedro that are not really connected to SJDA. I mean, you know, there's always, there's a niche, right? Folks, folks come to SJDA meetings, sometimes they don't, right? And other folks do their own thing because they're all small businesses and they're all, they're all just trying to, trying to survive. And so it's, it's very important for us to continue to, to do our standalones and also uh, be co-hosted by other organizations. So thank you, Blanca. Mm -hmm. and, and street closures are not, it's not a new concept, right? And I know that this street, we've had World Cup events there before, we've had Super Bowl events there, we've had Farmer's Market, for those of you who have worked for the city for a very long time. Bless you, Ben. <laughs> for those of you who have worked for the city for a very long time, Right, we used to all walk down there uh, when it was a farmer's market, right, organized by the, the, the San Jose Downtown Association. And what we're seeing in downtown is we're seeing a major upswing, right? We have 30 plus businesses opening up, right? We have residents who actually feel safe to come down and, and patronize our, our amazing businesses in downtown. And so for, for me and others on this council and, uh, and our small business, community along with SADA, right? We want to continue to see walkable streets in our downtown, right? We want our residents to explore the amazing offerings, right, that we have in, in bless you again, Ben. There's a lot of distractions here today, um, right? And so for me, you know, every time I 
have to connect. I'm an extremely busy person, and, and when, when my mom really wants to see me, she's like, I will treat you to Voyager, because she knows that's one of my favorite coffee shops. And so, and so I, I go there, because, okay, you got me with Voyager, so I'll go there, mom. Um, so um, it's, this is gonna be a win-win for, for, for our downtown and our community and our small business community. So uh, I continue to say that downtown is now open for business. And so moving forward, hope we're, I'm hoping that we're able to find funding, right, or partnerships to actually make sure that this street is closed down. Uh, and so with that, I urge my colleagues to support this item and uh, I motion to support item 8.1. All right, great. Thank you, Thank you Council Member. Council Member Foley? Thank you. I'm really excited to see this go to the next step. But, Blog, I had a question for you regarding the mural and the removable uh, bollards. You said 450000 How much of that is the bollards? That seems like a lot for a mural. So how much, if we just wanted to fund the bollards, would that be? Uh, so the, the previous or the latest estimates um, that ballpark estimates that I had received uh, working with colleagues in public works based on a project that they did recently. So we're, we're maybe now nine months or so out. I understand your head. All the, a all the bit. caveats. <laughs> um, Just to get an idea. But, but I believe they were, uh, they were somewhere between uh, Ten and twelve thousand dollar per bollard, and those are for the removable bollards. They're not the retractable bollards, so they'd be similar to what we have on like the Paseo de San Antonio, where they lock into place, and you could unlock them and remove them. Uh, the thinking is that that is the infrastructure with a removable bollard versus a retractable. There's not as much uh, disruption to the street, and it serves the same purpose. Okay, so, but the removable bollards require groundworks to come in and move them. Is that right, or? I mean, we would work out a system. Yes, it would require um, an individual to remove them when cars needed to come through. Right, when we're doing the, uh, when uh, trucks are coming Service in vehicles, to load yeah. them. And, that, and that's kind of, you know, what we have now is this agreement with the groundwork staff. Um, that they assist in moving the, the traffic barricades when um, uh, service and delivery vehicles need to access the street. Okay. Well, I, I really am excited to see this go uh, moving forward. I would like, I agree with the uh, business owners that lighting needs to be uh, really, is really important then in that area for security and also to shed a light on the businesses that are there and anything we can do to improve the landscape. So uh, I don't know if you're uh, looking at budget, fine, budget ideas for this coming budget cycle, but uh, it's something to think about as we move forward. Happy to support this and, and you, council member, and the city. Uh, council member Buffoli, I actually just found my notes yes, uh, from back in, in October, just to, just to confirm at that point. Um, they estimated about 150,000 for eight bollards on the street. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Council Member. I don't see any other hands. Tony, let's vote. Uh, Mayor, if, if I may, I would just, I did have some slides that were prepared and I just wanted to acknowledge one slide because this, this was a long time coming and there were a lot of staff members Please. that, um, that worked on this project, and so I would just like to be able to, if we sure. could, um, queue up that slide. Um, we don't need to go through any of this, but I would like to just acknowledge my colleagues um, that have been working on this. I think it's the slide before. Yeah, it was. I'm trying to go back. Okay, here. There we go. Um, I would just like to acknowledge uh, the city staff that has been working on either the Alfresco or the Pedestrian Mall Act on San Pedro uh, since 2020, and also you know, the leadership of our former mayor, Licardo, and our uh, District 3 council member, along with David Tran, who used to be in the council office and now is in our Department of, of Transportation. So just wanted uh, to give a shout out to uh, the almost 30 staff in seven different departments that, that have worked to, to come to this point today. Thank you.
Thank you, and yes, thank you to all of the city staff from our various departments who came together to make this possible. Really appreciate you leaning in and figuring out how to get us to this point. Thank you, Blagay. I know you were leading the charge. Thank you very much. All right, Tony, let's vote. Motion passes unanimously. All right. Congratulations, everyone. It's exciting. All right, we are on to the report of the city manager. This is item 3.1. Jennifer? Yes, thank you, Mayor and City Council. I'm very pleased to announce that we developed and shared with our community the first ever year in review videos, which highlight our dedicated and passionate City of San Jose employees who work as one team to provide 264 programs within 98 core services daily to our community. Covering last fiscal year, the videos capture how the city operates and serves our community, along with how important it is to work with all our partners and community to achieve the best quality of life for all in our great city. Through five different chapters, all of our city service areas are highlighted, including strategic support, community and economic development, neighborhood services, public safety, transportation, aviation, and environmental and utility services. You can find the videos on the city's YouTube channel, the city's social media platforms, and on Comcast Cable Channel 26. I would like to thank the city manager's office of communications, the fire department, and the housing department for their support in developing these videos. I know how proud our city employees are to be able to share their work with the community, and I hope everyone enjoys the videos as much as we are, we have. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate your leadership and the work of all of our city staff. We are on to item 3.3, the annual report on city services. This is a report of our city auditor. I see Joe coming on down. Allison, welcome. We have a 15 minute presentation, it sounds like. Whatever it ends up being. Let's jump in. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. I'm Joe Roy, City Auditor. Pleased to present our office's 16th annual report on city services. This report provides performance data on the cost, quantity, timeliness, and public opinion of the city services. We also include historical trends and comparisons to targets and other cities. The report builds on the city's existing performance measurement and reporting efforts. Uh, for this report, we select, uh, selected and reviewed performance data to provide assurance that the information presented selected and reviewed performance to provide assurance that the information presented presents a fair picture of the city performance. We didn't audit for absolute assurance for accuracy of all data points, but to ensure the data provides a fair representation of the city's performance. All city departments are included in the review. However, the report is not intended to be a complete set of performance measures for all users. I'm here with Allison Pauly from my office, who is the lead on the project, as well as the rest of my team who's in the audience who can answer any questions you may have. Representatives from the administration, all departments, I believe, are here as well. To begin, we want to give a little context to understand who we serve as a city government. With a population over 950,000, San Jose is the 12th largest city in the United States and the third largest in California. San Jose, as well as other major California cities, with the exception of Sacramento, have seen population declines in recent years. The city maintains an ethnically diverse population, about 39% Asian, 31% Hispanic or Latino, and 23% non-Hispanic white. 42% of San Jose residents are foreign born and more than half speak a language other than English at home. In 2022, San Jose's median household income was $133,800. However, the cost of living is among the highest in the nation. For example, the observed rent index for San Jose remained above other California cities with average monthly rents of $2,700 for all unit types as of mid-2023, and the median home price was nearly $1.6 million. Meanwhile, 14% of households earned less than 35% in income or benefits, and an estimated 6,300 residents were homeless according to the 2023 homeless census. In 2022-23, the city's departmental operating expenditures totaled $1.9 billion, or about $1,983 per resident. General fund expenditures totaled $1.6 billion. Overall, there were 6,884 full-time equivalent positions in 2022-2023. 
San Jose has or does employ about 7.2 people per 1,000 residents, which is fewer than other large California cities that we've surveyed. 2023 marks San Jose's third year conducting a community opinion survey in coordination uh, with True North Research, uh, our office, and the city manager's office. The purpose of the survey is to provide a statistically valid sampling of resident opinions about their community and services provided by local government. 47% of respondents rated the overall quality of life in San Jose as excellent or good, which is about the same as the prior year results. 49% were satisfied with the city's overall performance in providing municipal services. Satisfaction with specific government services varied, with the highest rated services being the airport, the library, providing trash, recycling, and yard waste services, and providing fire protection and prevention services. The lowest rated services were addressing homelessness, facilitating the creation of affordable housing, and cleaning up trash on our streets, sidewalks, and public areas. Among resident priorities for specific changes to make San Jose a better place to live, addressing homeless issues was the most commonly mentioned, followed by providing more affordable housing and improving public safety and reducing crime. I do want to note that Dr. Timothy McClarney from True North Research is here via Zoom, and if there are any questions at the end of the, about the survey or methodology or related questions, uh, he will be available, or at least until 3.30. So the city provides a wide array of services that residents, businesses, and other stakeholders count on, and the administration has selected its top six performance measures across the city's key lines of business or city service areas. These include community and economic development, environmental and utility services, neighborhood services, public safety, transportation, aviation, and strategic support. We've included these CSA level performance measures in our report, and additionally, we have interactive dashboards on our website, and we include dashboards for each of the CSAs. We want to note that the administration has been working to improve its use of performance measures with a renewed focus on performance management. This includes an initiative to update CSA measures and the adoption of the City Council's four 2023-24 focus areas, which as you know include increase, increasing community safety, reducing unsheltered homelessness, cleaning up our neighborhoods, and attracting investment in jobs and housing. The administration will be coming forward in the coming weeks with second quarter performance results in those focus areas. Now I'd like to provide some additional highlights for the different uh, service areas, although all departments are included in the report, I will not discuss each. I primarily want to give a picture of the city performance across the different CSAs, as well as provide a bit of context around the performance. The first CSA will cover public safety. So the Emergency Operations Center, or EOC, was activated three times in 2223, including responses to extreme heat during August of 2022 and winter storms. Police handled about 1.4 million calls for service and responded to about 182,600 Priority 1 to 4 incidents in 2223. The citywide average response time for Priority 1 calls was 7.7 .7 minutes above the 6 minute target and higher than the prior year. On average, police responded to Priority 2 calls in 25.4 minutes, well over their 11 minute response target. 59% of respondents to the community survey reported San Jose as a place, safe place to live. The fire department responded to about 109,000 incidents in 2223, including 4,600 fires. <coughs> Excuse me. The department responded to 66% of priority one incidents within its time standard of eight minutes, a decrease from the prior year and below the eight minute or 80% target. It also responded to 91% of priority two incidents within 13 minutes, target for that is 94%. The next CSA we'll cover is Community and Economic Development. 6,266 San Jose residents were homeless when the 2023 homeless census was conducted. Through the collective efforts of local jurisdictions and nonprofit service providers, 3,472 homeless San Jose residents received assistance into, into housing in that fiscal year. Also, developers completed 210 affordable units with city help in 2022-2023. Shifting to a broader economic development measure, San Jose had 0.8 jobs per employed resident in 2022, below the envisioned 2040 target of 1.1 job per employed resident. Of submitted plans that received a review, 62% of plan checks for development projects were completed within processing time targets below the target of 90%. 80% of inspections were completed within 24 hours and 84% within 48 hours. Number of building permits issued were similar to the prior year, which was a return to pre-pandemic levels. 
However, the value of construction has been decreasing since 2020, 2021. Next, we have transportation aviation. The number of airport passengers increased to 12.1 million in 22, 23. However, this is below, still below pre-pandemic levels. The airport serves 17% of the regional passenger market, which is still below the five-year goal of 18%. In 22, 23, 150 miles of street were resurfaced and 78 miles were preventatively sealed as part of the pavement maintenance program. And overall, Department of Transportation or DOT rated city streets as good. That's 71 out of 100 on the Metropolitan Transportation Commission's Pavement Condition Index. The map on the slide shows the ratings across the city's transportation network. The dark blue represents good or excellent, and the darker orange or red signifies streets that are in poor or failing condition. San Jose's fatal and injury crash rate remained below the national average in 2022. However, there were 65 traffic fatalities, which the Department of Transportation reports was a record high. The next CSA is Environmental Utility Services. San Jose Clean Energy provides businesses and residents with options for renewable and carbon-free energy. Uh, clean, San Jose Clean Energy served 350,000 ac accounts and stayed within its target opt-out rate of 5%. Customers saved between 0.3 and 3.4% compared to PG&E rates. And looking at the city's other utility services, 64% of solid waste was diverted from landfills in 22 23 the city continued to meet or exceed wastewater pollutant discharge requirements 100% of the time, and South Bay Water Recycling delivered about 4 billion gallons of recycled water. Next, neighborhood services. In 2223, city libraries had over 2.8 million visitors. Total circulation was 7.5 million, and library programs had a total attendance of 237,800. The both visitation and circulation increased from the prior year. They do remain below pre-pandemic levels. The city's libraries were open for about 59,900 hours uh, in 2223, 23 which is comparable to pre-pandemic levels. 29% of development park acres had a park condition assessment or PCA score of 90% or better, which is below the target of 56%. In 2223, Beautify SJ collected over 3,500 tons of illegally dumped material and 85% of trash pickups at encampments were completed on time, above the goal of 80%. 2223, the Animal Care Center sheltered 10,400 animals, down from about 14,500 in the prior year. The center attributes the decline to the suspension of the trap, spay, and neuter program for cats and kittens, as well as spay and neuter services provided to the general public. The center had a live release rate of 85%, which is down from the prior year. Last, we'll cover strategic support. Public Works and its partner departments completed 37 capital projects in 2223, 92% of which were completed on budget. 88% of budgeted positions across the organization were filled as at the end of the fiscal year, which is slightly below the 90% target. The Information Technology Department reports 73% of its projects met scheduling, cost, scope, and value goals below it, slightly below its target of 80%. And lastly, 98% of general vehicles in the fleet were available when needed, as were 100% of emergency vehicles. Lastly, on the finance side, the city met its general obligation bond rating targets for each of the three leading national ratings agencies, and the finance department managed $2.89 million or billion dollars in city cash and investments and procured $236.6 million in products and services. So additional performance measures for the remaining departments, including the attorney's office, IPA, and others are included in the report. Additional copies of the report are available from our office as well as, the, as, well as uh, posted on our website. I do want to thank all the many departments and my staff that contributed to the report. It would not be possible without all of their hard work and support. So we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate your report and the work you and the team in the auditor's office do each, um, each year to prepare this very comprehensive re report. And thank you to all the departments for tracking and reporting out to the auditor. Let's go to public comment first. Okay, I'm gonna call names. Um, when you hear a name, please come down. First speaker goes to the microphone. The other people can line up. Um, this security will also tell you the first rows reserved for the speakers who are waiting. Um, I do have um, about 20 cards, and then I have speakers online. So I have Eddie, um, Eddie Trong, Bill Wallace, Rigo Gallardo. Oh, I'm sorry, we're on 3.3, not 3.4. I have no speakers. I was impressed Sorry. that we had 20 speakers on this item. People are really digging into the charts and graphs. Memo. That's good. <laughs> Sorry. All right. 
Do we have any online? I have to go over to Zoom. <laughs> yes, we have two speakers. Paul, followed by virtual protest. Sorry. No problem. Uh, yes, Paul Soto uh, from the Horseshoe. Yeah, I'm in agreement with the mayor. Yeah, I was kind of enthusiastic uh, about 20 people um, really researching in what's happening in the city. I'm sorry that uh, that, uh, that wasn't the case either. Um, what I want to do is thank you for the report, Joel. Once again, just always, always, you provide the objective information that citizens like myself need to know to keep my government in check because I don't trust them. I don't trust them for nothing. And so we need that level of objectivity that you have consistently brought to the city for the past, I've been doing this for seven years, and I've seen just very, very consistent. So thank you for that. The issue that I would like to draw to is, the attention to is you can see a very marked uh, drop in affordable housing production. Now, when you look at those charts in the first couple of charts, you can see, I mean, there, there is significant progress up until 2016. Now, the reason why that is, I'm gonna tell you the reason why, the real reason why, just so that the public can know. In 2016 was when that non-disclosure agreement was signed. Now, there are people sitting on this council that were in on that. They know what, what went on in that Google deal. Now, there was three council members that signed it and one mayor, Mayor Licardo, Mayor uh, Raul Perales, and Magdalena Carrasco. So what they did is they signed that non-disclosure agreement, and you can see that from the time that they signed that, look at all the affordable housing that was built thereafter. It consistently and significantly just drops. It practically bottoms out. So what that tells you is that through the housing department, what they were doing is agreeing with Google that we're going to gentrify as many Chicanos, as many Mexicanos as we can out of this area. And then what's ever left open. V virtual protest followed by Mitzi. Okay. Well, in the realm of audits, where truth takes the stage, inspector and analyst unlocking each cage. They sift through the numbers, decipher the code, revealing the tale that the records have shown. Politicians and leaders under scrutiny's eyes, facing the questions, no room for a lie. In the dance of democracy, they find their place. Audits and breaks, their deeds to trace. Workers and dreamers, part of the scene, each with a role in the system's team. Get in where you fit in, the call of the day. Contribute your past, let actions convey. Open the doors, let transparency win. Invite us in where decisions begin. The pulse of the people, the heartbeat of trust. In the auditor's realm, we find what's just. So let the audits unfold, a narrative clear, a poem of progress drawing near in the dance of democracy where fairness begins, a symphony of voices where accountability wins. Mitzi followed by John. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Um, that gentleman who just spoke, I agree. The non-disclosures, I believe, are scary. I think as people serving the community, you should be honest with the community, and it's hard to do that when you sign legally, you know, <laughs> legal documents saying that you won't be honest with the community. Um, on that topic, I would just like to give this opportunity to Matt Mahan. Uh, maybe you could come forth and be honest about your rabbi in the Jew tunnels raping children. You are not on topic. Sucking. You're them. not on topic. John followed by Rocio. Yeah, but it's true. Why? Why are they in the tunnels under the synagogue? You're not on topic. This is about the city services that. report. You're city off topic. Services. No, it isn't. You need to stay on topic. Rocio followed by Judy. Hi, good evening. I mean, good afternoon, everyone. Rocio Molina here, Interim Deputy Director of Catalyze SV. I am excited to see the numbers and the report from the auditor to really shed a light on the direction in which, you know, our local government must go in order to better serve the needs of the public. Um, as a nonprofit committed to community engagement, we 
strongly support using community insight and gaining from the benefit of their knowledge on the ground and the experience that they have um, in order to create better services and better affordable housing projects locally. I think it's fairly clear from the presentation today that there is a need to continue the discussion around how do we create affordable housing that really addresses the needs of our community and really does so in a way that is responsive to those needs. The only way that we can see that working moving forward is in partnership with the community. So as we start to enter the budget season and get ready for the year, I urge all of you here today to consider the need for more community engagement locally and to bring community members into the discussion about how we create affordable housing that truly supports housing the most needy providing services that support their permanent housing and creates permanent housing that can be utilized far into the future. Thank you so much. Judy. Can you hear me? Go this, ahead. This is, hello there, this is Judy Stroyer. Um, I'm calling to uh, discuss this issue, you're talking about the um, the equity and, and diversity, um, inclusion and equity, uh, that stands for die, which means the killing off of the white race. You um, are not on topic. This is the city services annual report. Thanks for interrupting me. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get to my point here. If you give me a chance, sir, is that all right? Do we have to jump right to it? I'm against this project. I'm against women like a uh, rules. We, we lost your audio. Our Mexicans. Why is Back to council. Thank you, Tony. Okay, turn back to the council for discussion of the annual city services report. I have Councilmember Ortiz up first. Thank you, Mayor. That was an exciting comment session. Um, my first question is for HR. I'm not sure if we have a representative here who can answer that. Thank you. I see on page 78 of the report and section pertaining to human, ra human resources um, also maintains relationships with local educational institu institutions such as San Jose State University and Eastside Union High School District, which is great, to attract the next generation to careers and, and public service. I wanted to ask what specifically uh, HR is doing to maintain relationships with these schools, and are we making uh, the city a viable option for students here in San Jose's back door? Sure, uh, Jennifer Shembury, Director of Human Resources and Employer Relations. Um, so we're doing a variety of different things. We actually right now um, are planning a career day for San Jose State students to come here and just find out about the city of San Jose, and that's planning, uh, we did that last year. Um, we're doing that again in March, um, so any student can come here. Uh, we also have a relationship in, uh, are maintaining a relationship with Metro Ed or SCTVE, um, and we have a couple of things planned in, in February with them, a couple of different career fairs. Um, we recently did, and I was very excited about this, uh, with the East um, Side Union High School District, I believe it was Yerba Buena High School, uh, we had a group of students come here, um, and Public Works did an amazing job, if Walter Lynn's here, he was amazing, um, came here and they did a field trip throughout City Hall, um, and it was one specific class. Um, we took them throughout City Hall. They got to see a bunch of different things up to the top of the building um, just to learn about public employment um, and what you can do here at the city and, and the variety of different jobs that you have. So our learning and development team have been doing um, things like that. And so there are small things, but getting people interested in public service, getting students as early as possible interested in public service is our goal. That's great. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on what our partnership with Metro Ed looks like? Say that again. I'm sorry. Just, can you... Uh, share more about what we, we do in partnership with Metro Ed? Um, so mo mostly career fairs. So they hold a lot of different type of career fairs. So we send our um, different groups out there. So uh, I forget what the specific one is that's in a couple of different weeks, but different departments are going out there. So for example, I know that Public Works is actually sending their staff out there. Um, so that not only my HR recruiters are going out there to speak kind of generally about city employment, but the people that are actually doing the work are going out there also to speak about the, um, the employment as well. Have we ever hired a Metro Ed uh, graduate? I actually do not know okay. specifically. It'd be good to see if we could get some measurements and metrics on that because I'd really like to um, be able to reinforce that in our discussions. Absolutely. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if we have a representative from the independent police auditor 
here. Um, okay, well, on the record, I'll just mention this and hopefully I can follow up with her. But in the section of the independent police auditor, I've seen the complaints have been increasing since 2019 and community meetings have significantly gone down, going lower than the number of meetings being held during COVID, um, which was founded on uh, page eight. I'm interested in just learning why these numbers are tracking in this pattern and, and they're a concern for me. Um, my next question is for PBCE, um, both PBCE and uh, second question specifically for code enforcement. I don't know if we have anybody from that. Hey. I'll, I'll get to start, uh, started on um, the question. Last month, our city auditor presented a report finding that major staffing and workload imbalances have impacted the timeliness of the permit process. Their number one recommendation was to develop a more robust staffing strategy, including expanding recruitment efforts and to reassess the department's use of consultants. Um, I just wanted to see um, if there's anything been done, any strategy put together um, in the last month, um, and if, if so, if there's any timelines. Thank you, Council Member Chris Burton, Director of Planning, Building Code Enforcement. Um, we have a, a, an ongoing work plan specifically around hiring, really targeting uh, where we're focused on those placements that are most critical to our operations. As we've discussed through that audit and in the past, um, certain positions in our building group are really critical to us right now. Um, we have a, a recruitment that's currently in process around associate engineers to help fill that 30 plus percent uh, vacancy rate right now. So we have an ongoing plan around the recruitment. Um, there are some additional pieces that we're working on in response to some of the recent discussions on how we engage better with our staff, uh, as well as building on what Jennifer said around building relationships around local education institutions so we can continue to uh, look for those opportunities to find the right people to fill those okay. positions. Great, thank, thank you for your, your answer. Um, this is a specific code enforcement question. Uh, according to the community survey, the percentage of residents who are dis dissatisfied with code enforcement outweighs those who are satisfied. Um, do we have any understanding of why that may be? Are people losing you know, faith with uh, their complaints being submitted or is it just that, um, is it a staffing issue? Just um, so obviously there's a, a number of different factors that go into that and code enforcement is certainly a very difficult sort of part of the work that we do. Um, understanding that there are always two customers with every code enforcement case, the, the person who complains and the person uh, whose property we're dealing with. Um, as far as sort of customer satisfaction levels over time, um, my assumption just quickly without really digging into this would be around some of our staffing challenges. Obviously we've spent the last year staffing up in code um, and you've seen that our uh, rate and ability to close cases has continued to increase. Um, so the number of cases sitting in our backlog is now back below 4,000. Um, so as we continue to address that and work through those issues, uh, obviously uh, we hope that those rates will increase uh, with customer satisfaction um, and we'll continue to monitor that. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Um, thank you, that, that's all my PBCE and I've got a few minutes left. Um, my next question is in regards to, uh, I guess, legal. Um, I don't, Nora, I don't know if you would be the one to answer this. Uh, question. I see that there's been an increase by almost 150% of lawsuits and administrative actions filed against the city, which is attributed, you know, to the termination of COVID-19 pandemic restrictions. Are there any other reasons that lead to this increase? Not that we're aware of, Council Member. Um, we we are aware that there's a huge increase in lawsuits that we have filed, um, but that is primarily the criminal cases in connection with um, the sideshow prosecutions. And uh, that, that number is, um, has become huge. And, uh, 150 percent increase? Mm -hmm. wow. Okay, that's a very sizable one. Maybe we could talk more about that offline. Um, and then, Maybe my final question, we'll see if I run out of time. Uh, this is in regards to the public library. Um, I wanted to ask, will the expanded li uh, library be something the council will need to consider reinstating in this fiscal budget?
Uh, good afternoon, Jill Bourne, City Librarian. I'm sorry, Councilmember, could you restate the first part of the question? Like, will the expanded library hours be something we would need to reinstate um, during this budget due to the fiscal, um, the fiscal budget? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the council did take action last year to fully annualize the addition of the Sunday hours that had been proposed previously and the partial restoration of hours that had been cut during COVID. So while we, as the auditor noted, um, on a weekly basis, the number of hours are relatively equivalent to what was there in um, during the pre-pandemic times. Those hours are now stretched across seven days in several locations. So, you know, there is the opportunity to possibly add back um, hours, you know, here or there. But um, in general, we're, we're back to the number of hours weekly, and we're actually at seven days per week at 16 locations. Okay, that's, that's great to know. I did notice, I don't know if it's just my district, but we've been seeing a lot of low visit counts in, in some of our libraries. Do we have any information of why this might be happening? We're still, um, you know, people are still coming back. Uh, after the pandemic, we're reinstating things like class visits, which used to be super active prior to uh, COVID. But uh, schools, you know, have to are managing that process as well. And so it's a it's a combination of a library being open, but also having partners that can bring folks into the door. Um, we've also been doing more outreach, and we have more. One of the interesting data points for me was just. We finally saw a really big jump in our e-resources usage, so e-books and e-collections, which is not surprising. Um, during the time during the pandemic, we were closed. All of a sudden, people started using our online co collections much more and have maintained that usage. So I do think that we see more virtual use, and we're going to be watching that um, balance of in-person and virtual. I, I noticed that specifically in my libraries, there's um, a very low uh, visit count is that do you think there's something like programs that are being offered in other libraries that are the east side libraries aren't aren't essentially offering um, i think what i would like to do i think that the usage is starting to come back but um we'll, we could do some looking and see what might be attributing yeah, to those specific i'm just thinking items. my community yeah. needs it they need those resources so i'm trying to figure out what the gap is to them coming in through the door. And to your first question, actually, one of the things that we are looking at is that um, in working with specific, some specific communities, we find that they may want um, more uh, like evening hours on a weekday, right? That maybe there are fewer places for kids to do homework after school. Whereas in some other communities, those weekend hours are the most important. So um, constantly looking at the data to see if we need to sort of readjust hours rather than um, only adding, although adding is always great and highly welcomed, but um, it requires more staff, certainly, to do that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you, Council Member. Appreciate those questions. We'll go to Council Member Batra next. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm looking at the uh, first page, which is the jobs for employed residents in San Jose. Uh, it shows a decline from 0.9 to 0.81. Do you have any idea about what that uh, decline might be, other than probably moving out of this area? Or any, any insight into that? So thanks for the question. So the, the the results, the, the decline from 21 to 22, we're not, uh, we make a note um, that it's being driven by a different data set in terms of the, the number of jobs. Previous years, we've been using the American Community Survey. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, OEDCA moved to pulling jobs data from the California Employment Development Department, and we took us a little time, but then we switched over with them. It's a bit more precise, uh, our understanding of the terms of the number of jobs. So we don't know if it's a real decline yet or if it's just a methodology change. We're going to keep looking at that over time. So right now, I don't know if that's a, a truly a decline from 0.9 to 0.8 jobs per employed resident. Right now, it's, we, don't, we, can't decide, we can't determine whether it's a real change or it's just a methodology question just yet. So we'll be keep, look, keep an eye on that. So, okay, so did I catch you that we don't have any insight into why the decline might be there? Correct. Okay, okay maybe, maybe Nancy, uh, she's here. <laughs> I could see she was already getting up. 
Nancy Klein, Economic Development. Really appreciate getting to work with the auditor, and thank you for the question, council member. As the auditor said, we're working and updating data sets, and these data sets don't marry precisely. We believe there is a bit of a decline, but that's uh, mainly because in all in all, we're actually building more housing than jobs right now. So that's uh, very small and incremental, um, but we're not that much out of line from prior years, and the bulk of that, I think you're, you're hearing what the auditor is saying, is the coming together of data sets. So, so Nancy, in terms of your comment that we're building more housing than the jobs, our emphasis, we're still short of short supply of the housing. There's more and more pressure on us to build more. And with the high density, we're going to be building a lot more. So are we going to see this number go down even more? It's possible. And, and again, just looking to uh, capitalize on the sites where we can build jobs and make sure that they stay available for jobs. Okay. All right, I think you've got a big challenge there to bring this number back up, even though we build more housing to get more jobs here. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you. Yeah. The second question I have is on the building. Uh, my page is right. We should show the building permits issued in two different ways, uh, the online and uh, on the counter. The new uh, permitting process, in the, which we got now going, is that going to fall under the online or on the counter, or there's going to be a third category to report in future? Uh, thank you, Council Member Chris Burton, Director of Planning and Building Code Enforcement. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think we'll work with the auditor to consider that, um, given the sort of scale and the sheer volume of permits we do. Um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, we'll have to think carefully about how we do that. I would assume it's going to fall under the over-the-counter side, so the issued permits, um, just because we're still tracking them in that same way, and they would typically fall under that subset. So we'd probably include them in those numbers. And hopefully the volume becomes so large that we a whole new category at that point move yeah. into a separate category by itself. Absolutely. Um, but thank you very much for moving from the on the counter to the online. Uh, the number of permits which you have moved there obviously shows more efficiency in there. Yeah. And, and the last one I want to uh, make a comment on is. <clears throat> the transportation and aviation services slide, uh, where we are talking about the payment, payment condition index rating, um, which seems to have moved for city of San Jose from 69 to 71, which is not just a two-digit change, but it is actually moved from what is called the fair to the good, and that is a pretty numb marvelous achievement for the city of San Jose because the size of the city of San Jose don't move two notches up that quickly. So thanks for all the work which has been done on that area and uh, keep the index moving up and the challenge will keep getting bigger. So thanks to the DOT for all the work they've done on that one uh, and getting that done. Thank you very much for the report. Councilmember Balter and then Mayor, if I could jump in really quick. Sure. So I think the Councilmember had two really good questions about uh, how we deal with either changing data sets in one case or how we change, uh, how do we address changes in the service delivery. And so you'll see throughout the report, you'll have like a chart with like grayed out numbers or we're, we're constantly updating how we're looking at, how we're presenting the information. We're constantly talking with departments about what has changed. That's the first question auditors have for departments, what's changed. And so 
it's part of our process to really kind of look at that and then try to present it the best way we can because we do have a pretty dynamic uh, a workforce and dynamic working environment because things are changing rapidly in each department. So just want to bring that up because it's, it's it, good points. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate that highlight. Okay, we're on to Councilor Torres. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Joe, and uh, uh, your other uh, auditors that you have here today. Uh, it's uh, This uh, survey is, uh, how can I put this? There are some bright spots, and then there is the concerning parts. And so I actually have three questions for three different departments. And so, so we can prevent the weird walk down. It's going to be for PRNS, fire, and planning and building. So if, if you can come on down. Um, but before they do that, uh, I'm going to ask a question to our city manager and Joe. Uh, so um, my question to Joe is, um, so I remember this audit from last year, right? Uh, is it possible to have next year's survey or next year's audit uh, with results from previous years of this of the of the audit? Um, because the reason why I ask, I know you're about to answer, Joe, but the reason the reason why I ask is I want to see if we're actually progressing year by year, right? And last year I had been just a few weeks in as, as a council member, right? And so those, whatever happened in, in January 2022, right? Yes, it was concerning, but right, those were 2022 numbers for most of us sitting on this dais, right? Now, now we're responsible, right? As elected officials and, and folks who run the city, these are our numbers. And Paul is right, I don't agree with Paul a lot, right? But yes, now folks need to hold us accountable because it's been a year, right? And so that's why I asked that question, right? And, and before I do g get onto my, my questions, I do, I do also wanna say, again, there are major concerns to, to this survey, right? Particularly with fire and police response, right? But also perception that some, of, some departments are underperforming. And we all know the underlying tones of that, right? We have high vacancies in most of our major departments in the city of San Jose. Uh, and so before I do ask my, my question, I, I do wanna say, to our hardworking city employees, thank you for all that you do. Thank you to our city employees for working day in, day out, and serving our residents with the limited resources that they have. And so I'm grateful to you as a former city employee. We were all colleagues, former colleagues, and I'm sure this, our, my colleagues on, on this dais are, are grateful to you, so, so thank you. Uh, and so you can respond, sorry, Joe. <laughs> no, that, that's great. So. You make a really good point about the, the survey results over time. And so uh, that is our intent, is to start including the historical uh, responses to the survey questions. This, the, we started this new survey three years ago and we wanted to kind of build up a little, kind of a, a little a richer history before we start presenting that because uh, a year to year, uh, often the results aren't statistically significant, but when you see three, four, five years of, of survey results, you get a much different picture. And so we were just really trying to build up kind of a, a, a base, a, a his, historical base, and, and our intent is to uh, include that moving forward. Um, but the, the point is well taken. I think I think it's really helpful to have that historical, kind of those historical survey results, and, and, and I hear you. Great, thank you. And the other, the question for, for Jennifer, and, and we've had online discussions about this is, but I want our community to, to, to hear this this answer since you've, you know, we've spent time talking about it. Jennifer, I've, we had a phone conversation last week and my question was to you, what, do our directors or our top staff use this audit report uh, to create work plans or metrics uh, for the following year to make sure that we are actually serving our, our residents in the city of and small businesses as well? Yes, thank you very much for the question. We absolutely do, um, and we do it in a couple of different ways. So when we bring forward the annual budget in May, the city manager's proposed budget, 
We're using this information to develop our performance measures for the following year and looking, and we also look in the past, how did we actually perform, how, what's our tar how, how are we on target to perform this year, and what is our, our target for the following year. We also incorporate this into the senior staff work plans and their performance appraisals. Um, in fact, we're getting, uh, doing a deeper dive on that, in fact, this year. Um, we work with the city auditor's office um, we have worked with them to align our surveys because we were working on two different surveys. You remember that? And when, back when I was in the budget office and we had a different auditor, we had two different type of survey methodologies and now we are aligned so we can look at the same data and interpret the data in the same way. So we've, uh, as you've heard from Joe, all of the departments work with him on developing this report and we're taking a deep dive and we're periodically reviewing them. We, also have now with the council's direction with us having the four focus areas we're taking even a deeper dive in those four areas and, and are doing surveys every quarter and looking at that data more rigorously as well so we do it in several different varieties but absolutely this is what drives the work that our employees do our senior staff does and what we need to do to improve the services to the community great Thank you, and so I think you, can, you probably answered my second, the second question to you is, so I recently had my, my police redistricting community meeting, and will this audit be used for the, our police redistricting process? It's one of the many inputs into that process. Okay, great, thank you. And then uh, my next question is to our fire department. Hi, Chief. So we have, uh, we have a large portion of our fire, de uh, fire department stations falling below in response times uh, when it comes to priority one calls. Uh, how can we replicate what is occurring in fire stations six and nine across uh, all of our fire stations? Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Robert Sapien, Fire Chief. Could I ask you to repeat just one more time? The sound is tough. Oh yeah, no. So, one of my, um, my concerns was our fire department response times, right? And so our priority one calls, right? They're not making it to the priority one calls. How can we replicate what is occurring in fire stations six and nine, which are our better performing fire stations uh, across our city? Thank you for the question. Um, we are, uh, I think, in the, in the very long process of trying to address response time challenges citywide. Uh, my personal efforts started all the way back in 2014. Um, and uh, in that time, we went through a process uh, which included a, a third party uh, organizational review. Uh, simultaneously, we developed our strategic business plan. Out of that plan, uh, we communicated with council multiple recommendations, which in part led to uh, Measure T outcomes, uh, which included the addition of fire stations. Um, some of the, th the uh, components that have not been realized uh, that were recommendations from that organizational review. Um, priority one uh, from those recommendations included the restoration of resources that had been eliminated due to budget, budget action uh, during the recession. Um, and we still have yet to replace uh, several companies. Uh, rough math, I think that's uh, 42 positions that have yet to be restored to get us back to levels prior to the recession. So uh, the work that we have done so far has been to increase our service footprint by way of addition of new fire stations, uh, we just are in the process of completing an ex uh, a completion of our fire station 24, uh, which will add uh, capacity for us to house more resources and personnel. Um, we certainly continue to find uh, creative ways such as rescue medic deployments, which are two-person units that help absorb some of the call volume. Uh, primarily, there are two drivers to our late response time performance. One is the distance between our fire station is beyond our four minute travel time goal. And two, call volume takes resources out of service very frequently, which expands our response time and instances where resources have to respond from longer distances. Great, thank you. So in a nutshell, hire more firefighters. 
Right. Ultimately, uh, we will cover uh, the, the city better and meet or come closer to meeting response times with more resources in the field, and that is, in fact, personnel uh, related. Right. Okay, great. Uh, I'm actually running out of time, so I'm going to cut my two questions to my other departments real short. Um, this is for PRNS. And real quick, um, and maybe I think maybe even Joe could chime in, but um, is the 237,800 program participant figures, uh, does that include duplicates? What, uh, that's 725,000? The, the 237,000, almost 238,000 participants, right, that we had come through our PRNS, does that include duplicates? Yeah, most of our data is including duplicate counts. Okay. All right, so I think, um, I don't know. I'll, we'll talk offline about that, but. Uh, yeah, but it's a, it, right, it just as real simply, it's a data question with our online system. It's a manual run for us to have to do that to find uh, unduplicated accounts. We can, but it's manual. Okay, great. Thank you. And we'll, we'll, I'll talk more offline if I need to, because I had more questions, but. <laughs> uh, and this one's for planning and building, because I, I actually don't want to do two, uh, two rounds, but. That's what those uh, emails and phone calls for. Um, Chris, 62% of plan checks received a, a review. The department contracts out a lot of our, our plan check work, yet we're not seeing results, right? Consultants cannot replicate essential institutional knowledge that our city employees provide. Um, why is the city so uh, reliant on contractors if we're not producing results? Thank you, Council Member. Obviously, um, there's a lot that goes into that as we continue to work with our contractors. I think the reality is, is that we've been sitting at a very high vacancy rate in our plan review group. Obviously, we agree that the productivity levels are higher when we use our in-house staff, um, and we continue to focus around that, uh, that area. If you actually look at the, um, uh, the numbers over time in the past year, we've actually reduced that number significantly um, as we've brought on those contractors. So it's not sort of fully reflected here, but if you look at our online portal that has all our dashboards and data on it, you'll see that the projects with overdue comments has come down from somewhere over 400 at the start of the year. Um, we're down under 60, I believe now. So we are making significant impacts okay. through the use of peak staffing. But again, that's always a balance with how do we prioritize ensuring that we have the right staff in-house to do the work. Okay, so in a nutshell, hire more planners. <laughs> All right, uh, and with that, I motion to approve item 3.3. Great, thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Dwan? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Chris, I do have a question for you, and also as a fire chief as well. <clears throat> I, I just want to clarify something. The, the reason that you have contractor is in order to expedite the service to our community to reduce the timeline that builders and so on have to wait. Is, is that correct? So council member, we've used peak staffing for over 10 years now to support our operations. And the reason we have it, and also the reason it's called peak staffing is because the way that permits come in ebbs and flows over time. Um, obviously given the nature of city business and the budget cycle, we can't always staff up in time if we see a high demand for service. So as a result, we have backup contracts that we use for peak staffing. When we see those high points in demand, that we can, out, you know, we can work with uh, contract firms um, to meet those timelines to actually get the services delivered. Now, what's happened post-COVID in the department and really what we've been struggling with is we've seen attrition through our plan review group, and as a result, we've been at a very high vacancy rate. So we have 18 full-time positions in that group. Um, we only have 12 filled right now, and we've been through pretty much constant recruitment over the last year and a half, two years for those positions. It's just a very hard position to fill. So as a result, we've been using peak staffing to backfill that capacity, um, because what we found, and as you've heard, uh, I'm sure from your constituents, is it was taking us a long time to get through the work. So we needed to meet the needs of residents and businesses by reducing the time to permit, and so we've been using contract staffing to support that and, and help us with that workflow. Have you reached out to Nationwide in, in order to recruit more 
plan is? We do, and in <laughs> fact, um, our latest recruitment, we're undertaking new initiatives. Um, the, the list of uh, engineers who can do this job is uh, a public thing, so we've actually sent out postcards to every engineer in the county for this latest recruitment. We continue to work with this. I will say it's something that we hear from all of our peer cities, and it's something we also actually hear from peak staffing firms, is there is just not the availability of these skills. So in addition to sort of how we hire around these positions, we continue to look to San Jose State and other institutions on how we can help build that capacity and grow the resources in, inside the department. Perhaps we can do some recruitment from a contractor. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a two-way street, though, so we have to watch that one. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Great, thank you, council I, member. I just have a quick oh, question please, for go our, ahead. our chief. <clears throat> Hi, Chief. Uh, thank you. Um, the San Jose Fire Department do an incredible job. We are heading toward 110,000 plus call per year. We cover 180 square miles in the city, uh, plus 20 square miles from the county. Would you say that, obviously, your statement earlier that our, our first due is quite large. In order to reduce the amount of that first due, we need more station, which is, what would you say, agree with that? Right, our, our recommendations for additional stations uh, was to close the space to account for high call volume and distance traveled, yes. And I know that we continue to have difficulty uh, recruiting uh, fire paramedic, if you will, uh, throughout the, the, the nation for that matter. Um, do we give incentive uh, towards uh, recruitment and perhaps even retention wise? There is a uh, currently uh, a, an incentive when we conduct lateral recruitments, yes. And in order, uh, sometime um, the data will show that certain station will have more calls than the others. So in order to accomplish the same goal with, um, for example, station nine and what other station that you mentioned there? Um, six, and nine. six and nine and 19. But if you compare that to station 26, station two, um, the, the call volume is much higher, am I correct? So therefore, when the station is out of their station, out of the barn, going to a call, in order to deploy a second due to cover the first due, then therefore the, the timeline extend, am I correct? Right, when resources are occupied, we pull from other stations, which means longer distances to travel, yes. And we also uh, mutual aid to um, our friends and neighbors um, city as well? We have both uh, automatic aid and mutual aid agreements, yes. And, and that, would be, that would cause some of our uh, delay in response, am I correct? Um, I, I, I wouldn't characterize it that way. I think our auto aid agreements are structured to get mutual benefit, um, where we respond to areas faster than our partners could, and they respond to areas in San Jose faster than we could. Right, and um, do you think, according to the study, um, I believe that as a large metropolitan city, um, 33 station is, is quite low amount of stations for the coverage over a million people on a, on a working day. How many stations do you anticipate um, the new station in order to meet that demand and reduce the amount of, uh, uh, of time to, uh, to the call? I, I think that's an evolving question over a long period of time. Uh, when I provided my recommendation on the placement of new Measure T stations, I included, I believe, 10 possible sites, which would mean that the, the three that we added, plus the added benefit that we received by expanding the Station 20 project, by that estimate back then leaves us um, with six more, perhaps. Well, thank you. Hopefully we'll uh, somewhere we can find budget and, and fund those other six stations. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thanks, Council Member. Okay, we're going to come back around to Council Member Torres for a couple more questions. 
Thank you, Mayor. Uh, can we have PR Nesbeck? Because this one was actually, I forgot to ask the most important question. And, and this is why I'm asking this question, uh, right? Because with, uh, with sample sizes of these uh, community surveys, right, it kind of uh, tells us a different picture of what's really happened. And so in this, in this survey, in this audit, right, our residents are not very popular or they think that our graffiti program is not working. So it's very unpopular, right? Um, and as a matter of fact, that they're doing a poor job. Uh, but we all know, because we've all we've all been to the cleanups, and we've all we've all uh, been out to um, our neighbor association meetings, talking with our residents, right? But that our graffiti program is working, right? They we put it up on 311. They come out within 48 hours, especially if it's gang related, and take it down, right? And they work with all the council offices, with. SJDA, with all the small businesses, you name it, they work with everybody to make sure that we maintain a clean city, right? So my question is, how can we better promote our graffiti program to show the work that they are doing um, while also providing everyone um, how to understand their work, that it's a, it's a process, and that sure, we see it every single day, but that our, our graffiti folks are out there cleaning up our city. Yeah, th uh, thank you for the question, Council Member. Neil Rapino, Assistant Director. Um, yeah, your point is well taken. Uh, traditionally, our graffiti program uh, is the highest customer satisfaction rated program in this SJ311 program. Uh, it regularly meets its target goal of removing graffiti in 72 hours or 24 hours for uh, gang graffiti or hate graffiti. Uh, so we do see it as a successful program. We're uh, eliminating the targets of over 3 million square feet of graffiti every year. Um, and so I think part of it is continuing to work with our partners, uh, your council, of, council offices, you know, the mayor's office, in communicating to the public, right, the success of what's happening. I know the mayor and many of the council members are out almost every weekend, you know, volunteering with uh, neighborhoods, doing some type of beautification and or cleanup. So, I think a lot of it is just continuing for us as a department to continue to put out the positive messages of what they're doing. Um, you know, our graffiti program is successful on the metrics that we have. It's a large city, 12th largest in the nation, so we are gonna have continued urban issues. Um, you know, that being said, uh, you know, we definitely do take the graffiti off as fast as we can. Great. And if, if I could jump, if I could jump in, Council yeah. Member, uh, you know, I, the, the public doesn't really care where the graffiti is, but in fact, sometimes the graffiti is not on our property, and it's, in, and it's part, it's responsibility of other jurisdictions, and so we really need to double down on getting agreements with these other jurisdictions, especially when they're in to the gateways into our city, and you see that graffiti for long periods of time where that would not meet our standards for our program. So that's another area where we need to really, again, work very hard on and get them to clean it up as well or, or, or figure out another way to get it off. Great. Thank you. And that's, that's it. We have more items on the agenda, so and folks are waiting for that item. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Councilman. I appreciate the question. And actually, I also have a few comments and questions just as we wrap up. I'll try to fly through these quickly. Uh, I'm particularly mindful of the, how this report, the timing of this before we get into our budget process. It certainly uh, helps me focus in on where residents want to see transformation, where they want to see us really uh, change the outcomes that we're getting. So I just want to touch briefly on homelessness, blight, and crime, the, the big three as I see it. Um, first, Joe, I, this is more of a comment than a question, but in these three critical areas which align with three of our four core focus areas. I noticed still some discrepancy between m which metrics we're highlighting or how exactly we're measuring. Uh, I know the scorecards and dashboards are a little bit new and we're still iterating on them, so that actually is to be expected. I'm just hoping that over the next year or two, we can bring these into greater alignment and make sure we're really crystal clear through your audit reports as well as what we do through the budget and otherwise on the outcomes that matter most to residents and that we're going to manage our budget and city staff against achieving. I don't know if you want to comment on that. I saw your mic go on. Go ahead. I, I think that's a, a really good point. And so you know, we were talking, uh, Allie and I, with the city manager's office. There's a couple different work streams. There's obviously the, the focus area work. 
um, and the dashboards and the, the quarterly reporting. There's also the work that uh, the city manager's office uh, is doing, updating all the CSA measures, and all these works. You know, we're talking with them. With future, try to align them yeah. better. We're kind of in the middle of it right now. Understood. So, so it's a, it's an ongoing. Yeah, piece. just want to flag for everybody. Yeah, that no, it's, I think we're all in agreement. We need to yeah. get those more clearly aligned right. and, and sort of ranked and, and in a hierarchy. I think Jennifer was going to say something as well. I was going to say I agree. I mean, this this uh, report focuses on last fiscal year, yeah. and obviously yeah. we've got new things for this fiscal year, and so we're slowly it'll start getting more and more in alignment every year as we yeah. again modernize our performance measures by our city service area. Yeah. Thank you okay. for the question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, second, just a comment. I, you know, it won't be news to anybody. Our um, residents' perceptions of, of blight. One of the biggest sources is is encampments. Um, the uh, highest rate of priority for residents by far, uh, twice as much as the, as the next closest, is addressing homelessness. Lowest rated city service is homelessness. So I think, I think it's pretty clear what the community wants us to focus on and where the greatest area of concern is. So I just highlight that. I think it's pretty obvious to everyone, but very stark in the data. And I think as we look at where, where we're going to make tough trade-offs, and uh, pursue new initiatives, put more dollars and staff time into getting better outcomes. I think it's very clear that it needs to be getting people out of unmanaged encampments faster and better managing the conditions on the street for those who are still out there and hold people to a um, higher set of expectations around um, you know, what we all are responsible for living in a community, whether we're housed or unhoused. Um, on EAH, just wanted to flag on page 74, Makes sense that it's in there, but wanted to note for anybody keeping score on the exits to permanent housing that the Guadalupe interim site had only been open for a month or so. So while it had very few exits, uh, I think that was simply due to the, the measurement period. Moving on to blight, uh, and this is a question on vehicle abatement if somebody is able to come down. Um, as we look at the frustrations related to blight, which was a top concern for residents, abandoned vehicles considered to be one of the major drivers there. And we've talked a bit about that. I'd, I'd like to hear from staff. I'm not seeing anyone come down, so maybe we'll have to follow up later. But I'd like to know how our work to reimagine vehicle abatement is going to finally move the needle on what continues to be a major pain point for residents. And if we don't have anyone who can answer... I'm trying to looking for staff. Is John Risto there? There he is. All right. Thank you, John. Sorry, John. I know it's a long walk. <laughs> but in terms of this, uh, resident frustrations with blight, abandoned vehicles once again was a top response, coming out with 31 percent of the reasons why people feel that we have blight in the city. We've talked about this a bit in the past, but I know we've done quite a bit of work recently to improve our service delivery in this area. Can you just say what your expectations are for what this score might look like next year? Yeah, thank you, Mayor John Rosa, Director of Transportation. And you're hitting on something that uh, we recognize as well. It is a, definitely a frustration for many communities out there about how, we're, how we've been dealing with uh, vehicles that have been described as abated for, for abatement or for storage. So we've been working over the last probably six months on a, on a new enhanced program for that. Uh, we will probably be rolling that out this spring. That's going to improve on both the way we're communicating back and forth through San Jose 311. It's going to really be a, an improvement in how those that are reporting these vehicles 311 are going to be provided a lot more information as to the disposition of our investigations. So that's going to help a lot in itself. Uh, in addition to that, we're actually going to be doing more of that investigation. Uh, council has approved some additional funding for us to enhance that level of work. So we're actually going to be out there bringing the bar down and abating more vehicles. Great. How much do you expect this measure to improve year over year? When we're, when we're sitting here in 12 months, yeah, how much? Yeah, we've, we've already seen... We've been trying to roll some of this out already, and we've seen some improvement. It's markedly, if I remember correctly, maybe about 20% so far. We hopefully will get that way higher than it is right now. Okay, thank you, appreciate that, thank you. Yep. Uh, on to encampment uh, trash pickup. 80% of encampments receive trash pickup on time, 80%. How do we define 
on time. Is this for specifically the sites designated as source sites? Is it a broader set? Is it a weekly pickup? Thanks. Uh, that's the measure for the Beautify San Jose team that has its routes around the encampments that we've identified, 200 and some throughout the city. Uh, so that is on a weekly and a every two week basis. And is that, so 200, that's roughly, I don't know, half, a third of the uh, camp. We don't really quite know, but there are we, hundreds yeah, of encampments. We, yeah, correct. That's a substantial portion, though, maybe yes. a third or more. Um, and when it's on the route, does the trash have to be bagged, or does it have, because there's a lot of trash out there that's not in the green bags. Uh, it's mostly the bag work that uh, really helps the team hit those goals. Okay. Uh, but they do are cleaning up around the space as best they can, but they are not fully cleaning a space to zero yeah, trash. You know, it's not the enhanced cleanup. Um, with those encampments that are on the route, uh, we're presumably giving them the, the green trash bags for free. I know we also have the cash for trash program. Are we setting expectations that trash needs to be bagged? Are, are we We are. That's part of the ongoing communication that our staff has with the uh, residents who are living outside. Okay. All right. Well, something I'll be interested to discuss further in the budget process is how we expand and, and do more in that area. As long as we've got folks out there, we, we've got to do a better job of reducing the flow of trash and other challenges. Um, okay, appreciate it. Thanks, Thank Neil. You. you may want to stay here. I had a question on graffiti to pick up on Councilmember Torres. Once again, one of our lowest ranking city services. I can see why. Very much appreciate Jennifer's point, which I want to lean into this year on getting other agencies to help us, to partner with us, to give us permission to do it, to help share the cost. This needs to be their responsibility as well. It cannot simply be our problem and our fault that the VTA land and the Caltrans land is covered in graffiti and trash. They either need to fix it or, or enable us and pay us to do it. Um, I've been starting to talk with counterparts at, well, administrators at Caltrans and VTA, but just flagging for everyone, I think that's critically important. I also want to note, and I'd be curious if, if you or others, maybe the chief, have thoughts on this. It also seems to me that it's not sustainable for us to clean up 15 or 20 percent more graffiti every year and just pay that ever-growing bill. That's going up a lot faster than tax revenue. Uh, so what, how are we thinking about using enforcement to start to bring down the, 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 the demand for that service, for lack of a better term? Uh, a number of years ago, there was a stronger partnership, a funded sergeant uh, within the San Jose Police Department that worked on and with the graffiti team. Uh, a partnership with uh, the police department and the DA's office as in, in a you know, concerted effort to find pl uh, prolific taggers, um, arrest them, you know, send them through uh, trial, and send a message to the community that uh, you know, graffiti is not something to... Uh, to do for our city. Uh, that is not something that we've had as a city uh, been able to uh, maintain over a number of these years since the cuts. Uh, but in terms of that enforcement, we did see at that time that it is, has been a successful measure. Um, we do believe in kind of the graffiti efforts that, you know, between what we're doing, which is kind of the intervention, we are just going in there cleaning it up, uh, to the work with PD, and as well as the need for uh, education and more community understanding about, you know, how do you become a better and true good citizen? Yeah, we need all three of those E's, yeah. education, eradication, enforcement. I just think without some targeted enforcement and some highly publicized cases of people facing consequences for vandalizing public property, costing tens, in some cases, even hundreds of thousands of dollars in damage over time, without sending that message to the community that it's unacceptable and you will face consequences, we put ourselves in the position that we're in of we're spending 10, 20 percent each year just trying to deal with an ever-growing problem. So I, I really want to encourage us to spend some money up front on more enforcement and to the extent that we have research that indicates that it works, education to, uh, to stem that flow of graffiti. Same goes for illegal dumping. Um, okay, thank you, Neil. Appreciate that. I'm going to try to wrap up here with a couple more questions. Uh, this may be more of a comment. On the code backlog, Joe, you know, I think we need to take another look at these metrics. I, I'm glad to hear that the backlog of code cases is starting to come down. That's great. We've had way too many with 4,000 in the backlog, so it's great that we've brought, down, we've brought down vacancies. We're starting to work through the backlog. But I want to just highlight 
you know, the metrics look good. 98% of emergency complaints responded to within 24 hours. Fantastic, of a target of 100%. 81% of priority complaints responded to within 72 hours, and yet 54% of respondents are very or somewhat dissatisfied with our efforts to address code violations. So it just feels to me there's a disconnect, and I'd like to understand what's in that backlog, how long has it been sitting there, um, how are we communicating with the people who complained, are we appropriately escalating to fines to get them addressed? I mean, it just, it seems to me that we have a long backlog that's sitting there and then people feel like, well, there's code violations and nothing ever happens. And I just, I don't know if that's, that's my hypothesis, but I'd like us to have metrics that help us better really analyze and understand why there's so much dissatisfaction there. So if you want to comment on that, it was more just a comment. You're welcome uh, to. It's one I can, I can bring up with the administration because this, is, this was one of the metrics that was identified through the, the, the review of the performance metrics in these different areas and it was identified by um, that the neighborhood services CSA, but I can talk with them. Uh, is this something that we want to be, can you, how can we better communicate this? How do we line it with some of those questions so we can, I can have that conversation offline with, with the administration and the neighborhood services group. Yeah, I think it would be good for us to analyze. I will tell you just to use a single case, and I'm probably overly emphasizing this one, but the plastic wrap, wrap church sat there, was a major source of frustration. People felt like we were not enforcing our codes, and then come to find out for a very long time we weren't even issuing fines. So it's just it's this question of are we properly escalating? Are we doing everything we can to force resolution, either by coming into compliance, uh, or, well, ideally by coming into compliance, but if necessary, fining, suing, whatever it takes to get people into compliance on these really egregious cases that have a very negative impact on the rest of the community. Okay, last two comments on, actually questions, sorry, uh, Chief Mata, I think this is for you. Um, on SJPD vacancies, I know we're putting a real emphasis on recruitment. I just wanted to ask, what the team's recruitment goals are for our academies. As I understand it, we have three academies a year. We obviously, this report indicates we're still short 179 street ready officers. I'm sure you'd say we're probably short 500 street ready officers. We have three academies budgeted for. What are the recruitment targets for getting people into those academies? And how do we get beyond just treading water in terms of headcount, get, getting to a point where we're growing the department again. No, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Anthony Mata, Chief of Police here. Yes, we do have uh, three academies a year. Um, the goal is to fill all of them uh, with 50 plus, uh, but again, given the um, public sentiment uh, of policing over the last several years, it's not just an issue here in San Jose, but uh, nationwide, and I think that we're uh, swinging it in the right way. Uh, given that um, we have a current academy that's going to graduate uh, next month uh, with 19, um, and then we have one in May with 26, and then our February academy that's due to start after the graduation, we have uh, 43 in that academy. Uh, also in June, uh, for the June academy, I'm happy to report that um, we have 80 plus uh, individuals and backgrounds, which will yield that. So again, our recruiting team is working hard, right, to uh, find the uh, dedicated uh, professionals that we need here at this department. Uh, we are not lowering our standards. Uh, we have a high set of standards here for the San Jose Police Department, and we're going to continue that. Um, some of the efforts that we've been doing is uh, going to schools, going to various um, public events, um, you know, in-house uh, re uh, recruitment events um, throughout the city. Um, throughout the state as well to recruit uh, the best and, and the brightest. Uh, in addition, uh, we formed a working group uh, with the city manager's office, uh, budget office, uh, human resources, and the police department, again, to come up with ways uh, and what we can do to recruit um, more uh, into the, uh, the police department. So, you know, looking at incentives, uh, what we currently have, and what we, keep, what we can expand on to um, improve uh, those uh, rec uh, re recruitment efforts. Um, and you know, so we're coming up with uh, various ideas. And, and you're, yes, you're right in that um, our vacancy rate right now is about over 100 um, officers, so maybe 
I think nine or ten percent. Uh, but again, that's the um, it's right now we're we're seeing a large um, former academies that are are retiring now. So we have to uh, find that um, that delta, right? Yeah. How many we need uh, to not tread water and to build uh, upon the um, the existing staffing that we have. And I know that um, you know uh, we're I think uh, OER uh, and uh, the POA and others are, are talking to see how we can retain uh, our current officers. Great, thanks Chief. I, I really appreciate seeing you and your officers out in the community doing a lot of engagement. I think it does help with recruitment. Um, obviously we increased the budget for outreach and marketing last year and uh, want to certainly encourage you to, I know you are, share with city manager and, and us how in the next fiscal year we might make continue to make strategic investments and expand our capacity to recruit. For the first time in a long time, it's actually our ability to attract qualified candidates. It's the recruitment side that is the limiting factor more than budget, which was not the case for many, many years. And so uh, I think we're all very eager to see those numbers turn around. It's great to hear that academy with over 40 recruits. That's very promising. Indicates that maybe after a five, six year decline, we're starting to see an uptick again in applicants, which is great. Final question, uh, which is for you as well, Chief, is on these uh, response times, particularly priority two. I'm, I'm wondering about, further, given that our staffing is where it is, clearly it's gonna take a while to dig out. Priority two calls uh, continue to have response times in excess of our goal. It's been persistently high. Are there more opportunities for call diversion, for types of calls that can go to CSOs, do we know to what extent we're able to start getting calls over to 988, that new service? What, what else can we do there to just bring down some of that, uh, that workload, just given the, the reality of our capacity? No, thank you, Mayor. Um, currently, our department is working with the city manager's office to look at those uh, alternative responses. Uh, so we will have an analysis here on what's being diverted to 988, um, what type of calls can the CSOs, I think that um, because they're not officers, they're, they're limited to the uh, type of calls. But uh, we've seen in our staffing, our prior staffing analysis that the more resources that we have meeting officers, the lower the response times. Yep. So that's, uh, and along with the, uh, the current um, matrix analysis, which is the redistricting plan that uh, some of the council members had mentioned that they're uh, embarking on and asking our community about. Uh, that will also uh, share some information as to how we can better uh, deploy our resources, you know, to lower those response times. Okay, and sorry, thank you. When would that analysis become so the I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Lee Wilcox, Assistant City Manager. That is currently scheduled for the third meeting of February. So as the Chief mentioned, the Department and City Manager's Office are working our way through that. Um, we're also going to be meeting with the county beforehand. We've continued to do that. There's a great deal of priority one and priority two calls really for the police department that are really driven around issues around behavioral health and i would say the 988 system is not uh, does not have the capacity yet to absorb a lot of those calls um and and so we have we, we have work to do there on where those calls really go or where do we have the expertise within the county whether it's the county or others nonprofits, on who can best serve those people that are in need yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, thanks, Lee. Appreciate that. Thank you so much, Chief. Thank you to all of our department heads for the services you provide to our residents. A lot of really bright spots in here, a lot of progress as we're starting to get to our new normal post-pandemic. Really proud of the work our city team has done. Also very clear on homelessness, blight, safety, some very foundational issues. We, we have a long way to go together. Joe, Allison, thank you for the great uh, city services report as always, we really appreciate it. Tony, let's vote. Um, motion passes 10-0 with um, Botra absent. Okay, thank you all again. We're on to item 3.4, amendment to Title 24 of the San Jose Municipal Code for a proposed responsible construction ordinance. This is our last item before the study session. We do have a brief staff presentation. 
Well, I'm sorry. We have land use and then we, is that right? Land use after. No, land use is after. After. Yeah, after. Yeah. I said before the study session. No, study session. Then we'll come back. Yeah. Matt, feel free to jump in when you're ready. I believe you have a short staff presentation. Very brief, sir. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Matt Lesh, Director of Public Works. We're here to present item 3.4, the amendment to Title 24. With me today is Nancy Klein, the Director of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs, Chris Burton, Director of Planning, Building, and Code, for, Code Enforcement, and Chris Hickey, the Division Manager and the uh, Director of the Office of Equality Assurance in the Department of Public Works. Uh, very brief timeline in April, uh, we were to directed to develop and return to council with the responsible construction ordinance. We did so in December. Um, that at further, we were further directed in December to broaden our outreach and return with amendments to the original ordinance uh, based on feedback that we were also directed to, to expand. Um, we are here today to present uh, some recommendations with modifications to what we shared in December um, uh, to that ordinance draft. So. Public Works, Planning, Building, Code Enforcement, and Office of Economic Des Development met with uh, developers, contractors, and finance uh, stakeholders, as well as labor stakeholders at both De December 20th and on January 3rd. All these meetings were held both virtually and in person to develop feedback. We received uh, great feedback both in person and online and through writing and sharing with us their thoughts and feedback of what we shared. Um, very briefly, our recommendation today is a slight modification to what was represented in December uh, 12th based on the feedback that we ha shared to modify the limit of the basis of violation of the unpaid wage judgments to employees and contractors who are working on the San Jose permitted job, which is subject to the certificate of occupancy. Also limit the unpaid final wage judgment to those that can be verified at the California Labor Commissioner's portal and with a modification to the exemptions um, to be only those that are prevailing wage, uh, subject to prevailing wage under state, uh, California state law and projects under, uh, under 10,000 square feet. Briefly applicability and the exemptions just for clarity. Um, permitted projects as noted, subject to the cert certificate of occupancy and employees and contractors working on the San Jose project and only final judgments confirmed through the California Labor, Labor Commissioner's portal and clarifying that those exemptions again were permitted projects under 10,000 square feet and projects which are again subject to prevailing wage and we're here for questions. Thank you very much. We're going to go to public comments first. We will start with in-person commenters. When I call your name, Please have a seat in the front row here in the reserve seating. Eddie Trung, Bill Wallace, Rigo Gallardo, Louise Arnham, and Doug Blotch, please. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Mayor Mahan and City Council members. My name is Eddie Trung, and I'm here today representing NAOP Silicon Valley. NAOP is the leading organization representing over 200 local developers, owners, investors, and related professionals in the commercial real estate industry and mixed-use market. First, I'd like to start by thanking Mayor Mahan and his staff, uh, especially Vince Rocha, for convening the business community to share how the original draft of the policy would have made San Jose's housing and jobs crisis even worse. Thank you to Councilmember Davis uh, for speaking to every stakeholder to craft better public policy, uh, as the original ordinance would have done very little to address wage theft and would have had disastrous consequences for job creation and would have made housing less affordable. But I think we're in a better place today because of you. Thank you. Uh, finally, I want to thank uh, Councilmembers Jimenez, Torres, Ortiz, and Foley for supporting Councilmember Davis's memo to find a consensus position that would not limit San Jose's future growth and potential. 
This is an excellent example of how we can craft better public policy, starting first with engaging with the business community early and often. We look forward to reviewing the city attorney's draft ordinance when it returns to the council and hope the law is not written too broadly as to avoid inviting the unintended consequences of stifling growth and development in San Jose. In closing, please vote to move forward the joint memo authored by council members Davis, Jimenez, Torres, Ortiz, and Foley to move San Jose forward. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and uh, members of the council. Uh, my name is Bill Wallace, and uh, I'm here to strongly support this ordinance. I think it's very important for workers who are most at risk. Uh, they are probably the most powerless in terms of uh, being preyed upon by unethical businessmen. So once again, I recommend a strong yes vote to this ordinance. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, Mayor and uh, distinguished city council members. My name is uh, Rigoberto Gallardo, and uh, I'm a field representative for the NorCal Carpenters, and I address you today on behalf of the Carpenters Union, expressing our concerns regarding the current ordinance aimed at tackling construction wage theft and tax fraud. While we acknowledge the gravity of these issues, we believe that an ordin ordinance solely focused on judgment may not be the most practical solution or for prevention. We are not supportive of this ordinance brought to you brought before you as written. Construction wage theft, tax fraud de demand our attention and the Carpenters Union, Union proposes an alternative language that places a strong emphasis on transparency. We firmly believe that transparency is a fundamental building block in identifying the key players in the construction industry, enabling developers and general contractors to make informed decisions to avoid associations with those engaging in malpractice. The proposed alternative suggests holding applicants for building permits accountable for the timely submission of up-to-date lists of significant contractors. The submission should include essential information such as contractor's license, business license, taxpayer ID, workers' comp carrier, and whether the company has any California Labor Code-related judgments within the last several years. By implementing this comprehensive approach, we aim to create a system that not only deters wage theft and tax fraud, but also provides a practical and reasonable solution for the construction industry. We understand the importance of sending a strong message against malpractice, and we believe that a focus on transparency will be more effective in achieving this goal compared to a ban based on judgments. A ban on con contracting with some con subcontractors with judgments as proposed in the current ordinance may only yield a symbolic victory from campaigners against wage theft. The Carpenter Union seeks collaboration with the City Council to re refine and enhance the proposed measures. Thank you. Next speaker. I'd also like to call down um, Malia Tennisketter, Erica Valentine, and Danny Mangan. Thank you. Afternoon, Mayor, Council Members, Louise Auerhan with Working Partnerships. Um, and I'm here to support the, count, the memo drafted by council members Davis, Foley, Torres, uh, Jimenez, and Ortiz, um, and to thank the whole council for your support for this ordinance in December. Uh, again, we know that wage theft um, has long been a plague in the construction industry in San Jose. Um, currently, we have looked at uh, open unpaid wage theft judgments, over 50% of judgments levied by the state of California against construction contractors have still not been paid, which means the workers went through the entire process, uh, which is very intimidating. They got a judgment, their wages were stolen, and then nothing happened. This ordinance would give those workers the power to collect, and that is going to be so important, both to prevent wage theft and to help workers who have already suffered. Uh, I do want to note, as, as my the Carpenter's colleague previously mentioned uh, the January 12th staff memo uh, with a bit of a misdirection. It made some changes that would have made the ordinance entirely ineffective in preventing wage theft. 
Thankfully, I think the memo by Council Member Davis and colleagues is a good compromise that removes some of the complexity while still giving workers a powerful tool. Uh, thank you very much for moving this forward, and I hope that we'll be able to work together on implementation and really getting this into the hands of workers um, and helping to lift up all of those many responsible contractors and businesses in San Jose. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon, council members and mayor. My name's Doug Block. I'm with the Silicon Valley MEPS, which includes the Sheet Metal Workers Local 104, UA Local 393, IBEW Local 332, and Sprinkler Fitters Local 483. Our unions actually began the push for this ordinance in 2017 when the U.S. Department of Labor arrested an unlicensed subcontractor for forcing 22 Mexican immigrant workers to build luxury housing in San Jose without pay. And at the end of every evening, the contractor locked them in a shipping container. And that's what this ordinance is all about. We want to make sure that companies like that, the worst of the worst, are not working in San Jose unless they fix their ways. Our unions partner with companies that are creating good paying jobs for our local communities, and they can't compete with companies that cheat their workers. If you're a company, or if you work for a company, that pays their workers what they are owed, then you have nothing to worry about with this ordinance. It's simple. Workers need it. San Jose will be a leader if you pass it. So I urge an I vote on the memo, and I want to thank Council Members Ortiz, Davis, Foley, and Jimenez for your leadership on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, good afternoon. Hi, my name is Rocky Hill. I'm the owner of Premier Recycle. We're a recycle company. Actually, we recycled all the material in this building. When it was built, we diverted 70, 80% from the landfill. I'm not here to discuss the merits of the proposed legislation, just some thoughts. Thoughts on throwing out the term wage theft. No legitimate business likes the idea of wage theft. It's robbery. Bad, bad players do it and should be prosecuted if found guilty of participating in it but it can be used as a weapon by bad players. My family came to San Jose in the 1870s. They lived on 26th Street. My great uncle, Albert Jayette, was mayor here in the 20s. Our family has had businesses here for most of those years, right here in San Jose. We take pride in the businesses. We are thankful for the many, many employees and partners we have here in San Jose. We've been very, extremely lucky to be part of San Jose's history. But I can tell you, we've never had any wage theft claims against our business as far back as records and memories serve. I was quite taken back when on March 23, 2003, your fellow councilman, Peter Ortiz, hands us a letter on city council stationery in front of our office that says he, Peter Ortiz, Omar Torres, and Domingo Candelas have heard concerns of wage theft at my business, and they want it known that they will take this as a personal issue. No, we have ne they never called, they have never done any research. We have no history or any charges of wage theft. They were just using it as a threat. Mayor, I thought we were supposed to keep our comments to the entire body, not to individual council members. I'm sorry, what? I think he's citing a letter, but go ahead and finish your comment. Okay, they were just using it as a threat. What else would any business owner feel receiving the letter on official city stationery, hand-delivered, First contact I have with Ortiz, Torres, and Candelas, and I'm being accused of wage theft. And to boot, I'm not even in their district. I'm in District 7. Then Councilman Peter Ortiz. Uh, Rocky, if you can speak to the council as a whole. Thank you. Your time is up. Next speaker. Your time is up. Sorry, you're at the two-minute time limit. Sorry, Rock, you're at the two-minute time limit. I'd also like to call down Dominic Torino, Will Smith, and Scott, I think it looks like Yodel, Scott Yodel. 
Go ahead. And just to, just to clarify the point my colleague made, uh, everyone giving public comment, you're welcome to, uh, it would be best if you would address your comments to the council as a whole. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. Leah Tennisgetter, President and CEO of our San Jose Chamber of Commerce. We represent a spectrum of small, medium, and large businesses here in San Jose, many of which depend on project development and construction for their livelihoods. I'm here to speak in favor of the memo authored by Councilmember Davis, Jimenez, Torres, Ortiz, and Foley. We believe this memo captures the needs of businesses impacted by the Responsible Construction Ordinance while producing an agreed-to process by which we can collectively prevent wage theft. We look forward to supporting the staff and the language of the ordinance, which is very important for, uh, to avoid ambiguity, and want to thank you and city staff for taking your time to meet with all stakeholders to move this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon. My name is Erica Valentine. I'm the political director for UA Local 393. We are the plumbers, pipe fitters, steam fitters, and HVACR technicians in Santa Clara and San Benito County. First, I want to thank you for your memo, council members that wrote that. I'm here as a resident of San Jose, California as well. I lived and worked here for over 20 years. Today, I advocate for the 3,100 members that we currently have, the thousands behind me that have built this valley for 120 years. We have built this valley with individual residential homes, schools, colleges, sports stadiums, government offices, in fact, this one here that we're standing in, high-rise office buildings, as well as multi-family high-rise housing, all with responsible contractors, all with contractors that utilize skilled and trained workers that were locally living here. Over the past few years, developers and contractors have entered into this valley to put profit over people, removing jobs, people, and most of all, driven out the foundational contributors of this community. The developers and contractors claim they can't afford to build where we have responsible ordinance. However, Sunnyvale, Milpitas, Mount View, and the years behind us will prove that that is wrong. We need to be able to build responsibly, send people home to their families, their children. We need to allow people to be able to live in this area and work in this area so that they are paid a living wage, they are safe where they work, and they contribute to the overall community and economic development, as well as continuing to provide an opportunity for people to become skilled and trained in this Bay Area. The city of San Jose today is faced with a choice to lead or to be led. When you lead, you are looking out for your community. Thank you. That's time. Next speaker. I'd also like to call Todd Treckle, Megan Tennisketter, and DeForest Peterson. Good evening, uh, Mayor, City Council. My name is Danny Mangan. I'm a, a union rep for Sprinkler Fitters Local 483. Uh, I represent, uh, you know, about a thousand uh, sprinkler fitters, uh, many of whom live right here in San Jose. Um, and I'm here today to uh, just say that I'm 100% in support of uh, the Responsible Construction Ordinance um, for many reasons. One of those being uh, this ordinance is going to bring the cream of the crop. It's going to keep the cream of the crop of, of, of companies in, right here in San Jose. Uh, the companies that, that compete on the quality of their work, uh, getting jobs done on time and, and with integrity, as opposed to, you know, other, other contractors or companies that, uh, that commit wage theft um, or, or, you know, or, or that are going to underbid on projects and, and make that up and even more so. Uh, by committing wage theft and, and stealing, but f quite frankly, stealing from uh, hardworking middle-class people who are trying to uh, make a living and support their, their families. Um, we all know this is a great city, um, and because of that, it, it, it's expensive to live here. Um, so I can't imagine, you know, working hard every day trying to make ends meet and then having a, a company steal, you know, what's yours um it's quite frankly it's unacceptable to have that going on here in san jose so i'm um, looking forward to getting this ordinance uh, across the finish line thank you for your time 
Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Dominic Toriano, and I represent the sheet metal workers, Local 104, here in San Jose. It has been over six years since the discovery of slave labor being used on a downtown high-rise project. This council made a commitment then to craft policy that addressed this pro problem. It was, in fact, one of the top priorities. The slavery towers was not an outlier in the construction industry, but rather just a tip of the iceberg. I will remind the council that the developers utilizing this slave labor were also benefiting from de development fee waivers granted by the city. To the contractors who are here today opposing this ordinance, saying it's onerous and unworkable, ever push any policy or voice or concerns to the council to help ensure the council crafts constructive policy in regards to this problem. We all know the answer is no. They are here today only to obstruct the council's years of work on this issue. It is long overdue to address this growing problem. This ordinance helps ensure workers get paid what they are owed, and I urge you to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon, Mayor Mahan and members of the council. My name is Scott Udall with the Hanover Company. I'm here today to speak in support of the recommendation presented by council members Davis, Jimenez, Torres, Ortiz, and Foley in their supplemental memo dated January 18th. This recommendation will serve the objectives of the original ordinance proposed in December while mitigating the unintended consequences for the financing of new development projects. The, re the recommendation is the, uh, is the result of collaboration, and should it pass, I hope the spirit of collaboration with all stakeholders continues in the coming weeks as staff updates the wording of the ordinance. I'd like to thank Councilmember Davis for her leadership on this issue the mayor's office for their outreach, and staff for their hard work between December 12th and today. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, Mayor, <clears throat> City Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Will Smith. I'm a business agent for IBEW Local 332, represent uh, the electricians in Santa Clara County. Many of them live and work right here in the city of San Jose. I urge you guys to support the memo, the Davis, the Foley, Jimenez, Ortiz, Torres memo. Say that three times fast. <laughs> uh, I stood right here at this podium uh, six years ago, you know, pleading the case to stand up for uh, a heinous act that uh, I'm definitely not proud of. I'm sure nobody here is proud of, of what Job Torres did right here in the city of San Jose. Me, me personally being African American, I'm an IDOS, uh, or I'm, I'm actually a, dis a descendant of slavery. But that, that slavery happened over 400 years ago. We're talking about something that was occurring in 2017 in one of the largest cities right here in the heart of the USA, of, of A, right here in California, right here in San Jose. I can't believe something like that was allowed to happen. And the promises by the council was to prioritize getting this cross the finish line to make sure something like that will never happen again. But unfortunately, construction workers are exploited on a daily basis, on a very consistent basis. You have the opportunity today to turn the tide. It's sad that six years have gone by, but yet neighboring cities have been able to get this done, such as Mountain View, such as Sunnyvale, such as Melpitas. I think San Jose should be leading the way, especially since this heinous act happen right here. The last thing is we want to prevent or be an obstruction to construction because we have so many family members that make their living every day by getting up and going to these jobs, providing for their families. So please, I urge you guys to do the thing, do what's right, and to pass this today. Thank you. Next speaker, I'd also like to call down Ruth Silver Taub, Olivia G, and it looks like Miriam Bastano. 
Go ahead. Hi. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor and City Council. My name is Todd Trickell. I'm a development manager with Hunter Properties, a Cupertino-based firm serving this community for more than 60 years. We've built some of San Jose's most successful mixed-use projects like Coleman Highline and At First in North San Jose. Today, I represent many local developers, contractors, subcontractors, and small business owners. We appreciate your invitation to engage on the proposed wage theft ordinance after its December 12th uh, deferral. In our January 5th open letter to the council, we expressed concerns that the original ordinance could inadvertently harm its intended beneficiaries, construction workers. It risked disincentivizing development, including crucial housing projects, potentially hurting the very workers organized labor seeks to protect. Additionally, it imposed unfair liability on developers and contractors for unpaid wages from lower tiered entities, even for unrelated projects outside of San Jose. We commend Councilmember Davis for hearing our concerns and for initiating stakeholder discussions. The revised framework outlined in the January 18th joint memo effectively addresses them. We wholeheartedly support it as a balanced approach to curbing wage theft without hindering development and construction jobs. We eagerly anticipate collaborating with city staff in the coming weeks to refine the legal aspects of this revised ordinance. Thank you for your commitment to finding a solution that benefits both workers and our city's economic growth. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Good, after May May Good afternoon, Mayor Mahan and city council members. Uh, I'm here, uh, my name is Megan Tennisgetter. I'm the CEO of Tennisgetter Construction or a general contractor here in San Jose. And I wanted to uh, come down and speak in support of the memo um, authored by Councilmember Davis, um, Jimenez Torres, Ortiz, and Foley, um, and uh, the recommendations it has to staff. Um, I want to thank council and city staff for listening to the concerns regarding the original draft of the ordinance. Um, I do want to stress keeping the revi whatever revisions come out um, to keep them straightforward and with clear definitions. Um, that this ordinance is not only going to affect large-scale projects, but will also affect uh, smaller projects by, for smaller businesses, um, tenants coming into the city trying to, uh, to, um, to uh, bring their businesses here, and also to non the nonprofits that uh, reside in our city as well. Um, and I invite council and uh, staff to continue to utilize me and, and others as a resource as the, the uh, revised uh, ordinance is drafted. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker. Um, I'd also like to call down Zulma, it looks like Rivera, Peter Camacho, Miriam Kalem, and John Tucker. Hello, Mayor Mahan and Honorable Council. I support this, the current ordinance. My name is Dr. Forrest Peterson. I speak for the Center for Integrated Facility Engineering at Stanford University, through which my doctoral thesis work supported the various data analysis of data sets to support this ordinance, earning a uh, San Jose City commendation years ago as a result, which uh, the director of the research center still appreciates. Note that knowing up front at the time of the permit issuance about subcontractors, that will go a long ways if that information is public. And you could add that too. In my own data analysis for wage theft, I always include that. So I want to speak to my role as a teacher in San Jose. I've been teaching with the high school, the community college. I teach future managers at the community college and at Stanford, and I support three high school dual enrollment teachers to coordinate the program with union industry mentors, and I support the Waterproofers Union with their apprenticeship program where I help them, their instructors teach tech education. When I teach non-union pathways, I'm always concerned about the world I send my students to. Because without union representation, wage theft is their future. So I've been a member of the Laborers Union for 25 years. Now I know I don't look old enough to have had an experience in construction before that, but I did. I used to be a tile setter, and I set marble tile in San Jose. 
and I cannot explain to you how much wage theft I experienced in that industry. It was endemic. As an 18 or 19 year old, I was a lot thinner. I was knocking on doors telling people, you didn't pay John. And that's one of my favorite memories. And John did get paid. So please do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Good afternoon, Council. John Tucker with MEF AFSCME Local 101, uh, representing thousands of city employees. Uh, I'll keep my comments brief. We're in support of the uh, memo written by Councilmember Davis and co-authors, and uh, urge you to vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon, council members and mayor. My name is Ruth Silver Tobe. I supervise the workers' rights practice at SCU Law School and the OLSE Legal Advice Line. As Ash Kalra states in his letter, it is alarming that we have no wage theft policy for private construction after all these years. Although there are responsible construction companies, we've seen misclassification, falsifying records, worker kickbacks, retaliation, and multiple layers of subcontracting as a subterfuge. Developers are aware that their low bid prices cannot be achieved by normal business practices. Steve Wegner, regional manager of the Labor Commission, told me by email that, quote, finding judgments by industry is something we can do, unquote. It is simple to check the database. We cannot confine the wage theft ordinance to the project only. Steve Wegner told me by email that it takes an average of 750 days from filing to hearing. We must also include tertiary subcontractors. I support the memo by council members Davis, Foley, Jimenez, Torres, and Ortiz, and not the staff memo or recommendations, and I urge you to support it too. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Camacho. I am a resident of District 4 and uh, executive committee member of the Filipino Association of Workers and Immigrants, or POWIS, also part of the Santa Clara County Wage Theft Coalition. Um, I'm sure we already all know by now that wage theft is an endemic issue in our state, in our county, in the city. We've heard people say this in previous council meetings. We've heard, we've seen all the data that shows that. Um, but, you know, it's really important to reiterate, right, the impact that wage theft has on workers and their families. And, um, you know, the responsible construction ordinance is something that we should pass. Um, and uh, I want to show my appreciation to the council members Davis, Ortiz, Torres, Jimenez, and Foley for your January 18th memo, which represents a fair compromise and ensures that we uphold the integrity of the ordinance um, as opposed to the January 12th staff memo, which um, essentially runs counter to the original spirit of the ordinance. Um, San Jose can join the ranks of other cities that are leading the way in our county and the country to show that we're committed to helping workers who have been victims of wage theft to recover the wages that are owed to them, and also ensuring that there is a level playing field for the majority of law-abiding construction employers. So I urge the council to pass the ordinance. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, um, also Krista De La Torre and John Paul Wolf, come on down. Oh, um, good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Mariam Kaalim, and I'm also a resident of District 4. Um, I'm also with the Filipino Association of Workers and Immigrants, or PAWIS, um, that fights and advocates. Uh, for the rights and welfare of Filipino migrant workers. I'm here today to support council members Davis, uh, Jimenez, Torres, Ortiz, and Foley's memo in favor of passing a responsible construction ordinance that empowers workers to hold perpetrators of wage theft accountable. Um, as had 
been like said um, from like the previous um, speakers, wage theft is one of the most widespread crimes committed ag against workers in California, especially to low wage workers, immigrants, women, and people of color, and is identified to be an endemic problem in our region. Um, in fact, within California, Santa Clara County uh, recorded the highest number of wage theft claims for capita and the construction industry among the six high risk industries prone to wage theft violations. Uh, currently, there are more than $38 uh, million dollars in stolen wages from construction workers that remain unrecovered due to unpaid wage theft judgments since 2019. With this said, it is most crucial that this ordinance gets passed to rectify this injustice and ensures the protection of our most vulnerable and essential workforce. Uh, the ordinance plays um, an important role in preventing wage theft and the furthered exploitation and health and safety risk construction workers face. Uh, by passing this ordinance, it, is also, it also shows that as a city, we stand firm in our commitment to uphold not just our shared values as a community, but also your commitment towards serving your community. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. I'd also like to call down, it looks like Rocky Hill and I think I think the other name is Eddie. Go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Krista Delatori, and I'm here with IFPT Local 21. Uh, we represent many of our wonderful city staff here at San Jose, and as well as 11,000 public sector workers across the Bay Area as well. Um, our union is in full support of council members Davis, Jimenez, Torres, Ortiz, and the Foley memo in favor of passing a responsible construction ordinance that empowers workers to hold perpetrators of wage theft accountable. Um, the responsible construction ordinance will play an important role in preventing wage theft and ensuring fair competition. It is designed to prevent uh, wage theft, level the playing field for responsible contractors, and hold those accountable or hold those responsible for wage theft accountable. Uh, safeguarding our vulnerable workforce and promoting fairness isn't just a duty, it's a commitment to our shared values as a community and as a city. Um, so once again, I urge you to vote today to enact the responsible construction ordinance without delay and to support the memo from council members Ortiz, Torres, Jimenez, and Davis. Thank you so much. I'd also like to call down Bill Bailey. Hello, my name is John Paul Wolf. I represent IBW332, and I want to thank uh, Council Member Davis and her colleagues for drafting this memo. I speak in support of the memo. And in the interest of time, I just want to say that uh, it's not only about the, the, the law and the ordinance, but it's about, um, it's about keeping greedy people um, from exploiting people that are vulnerable and, uh, and protecting our society and our citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. Uh, I'm here in support of R uh, support of the RCO, Responsible Construction Ordinance. Uh, I'd like to speak personally. I've been in a local member of, of IBW332 uh, for many years. And before that, I was in the construction field my whole life since I was 20 years old. I'm 48 now. And I've seen a lot of the abuses uh, that uh, construction employers have used to try to control and manipulate myself and personal other employees and I, such as withholding wages or not giving the wages at all or uh, getting laid off or fired or withholding work because of you're speaking out against these uh, bad conditions. I myself and as personally other employees I've seen as well, uh, we had to make decisions to either pay rent or put food on the table and unfortunately some of those times we had to put food on the table and we weren't able to pay the rent and we got evicted and our families and our children had to find other places to live because of the abuses of these uh, employers. So I would like to urge the city council to vote for this and to stop the abuse of the employers of the construction field. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Bill Bailey, and I've been 50 years in Local 393. I've been to Vietnam. I'm 77 years old, and I'll tell you something. I've seen enough crap 
in my life, and construction outside of the police department and the military is the next most dangerous damn thing in this world. And this, this support for this is very critical. We, we go to work, and thank goodness, over the time I've been in there, they put in and instituted safety features. And this is one of them. Take and take care of our people. You know, it, I've seen many people get hurt just on a job, just an accident. They had a steam explosion over at Valley Med. It could have been avoided very easily. I went there the day after, or two days after, and then a year later they hired me to tell them what they did wrong. And I told them the day I was there. So it was a, you, you got to pass that thing. <laughs> That's all I can say. Thank you. Okay, I've called all of the cards that I have. I don't see anybody waiting to speak. If you put in a card and didn't hear your name, please come on down. I'm gonna move to the Zoom speakers, but I can come back to the in-person. Um, next speaker on Zoom is Connie, followed, followed by Dennis. Hi, good afternoon. This is Connie Chu, union member of SEIU 521 and a delegate of the South Bay Labor Council. I'm supporting council members Davis, Jimenez, Torres, Ortiz, and Foley's memo for a responsible construction ordinance that will empower workers to hold accountable the perpetrators of wage theft. This is the most common crime committed by California uh, against California residents, especially toward low wage workers, immigrants, women uh, and people of color. Um, the US Department of Labor estimated that workers overall in California lose a total of 22.5 million to 28.7 million each week due to minimum wage violations alone, which is just one of the many um, types of wage theft. And RCO is crucial to rectify this injustice and is important for San Jose communities and the Bay Area. Thanks to the council members who support this important issue, and please vote today to enact the RCO. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis, followed by Chris. Well, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council. Dennis Martin speaking on behalf of the Building Industry Association of the Bay Area. BIA supports the January 18th, 2024 Joint Council Memorandum. The memo outlines a compromise measure that improves on both the draft responsible construction ordinance and the options presented in the staff supplemental memorandum of January 12th. Still, BIA members remain concerned that this ordinance is both unnecessary and overreaching. As detailed in our January 5th letter to Mr. Matt Loesch, among BIA's chief concerns is the potential for improper interference in obtaining the final certificate of occupancy and the associated risk that this interference poses in obtaining project financing. This interference with the certificate of occupancy remains the RCO's biggest flaw, even in the compromise put forward in the council memo. However, as a compromise measure, BIA does recognize that the council member outlines the least worst measure that can be achieved today. And so we lend our support and express our thanks for those efforts to forge a workable compromise. Additionally, BIA requests that the council direct staff to continue robust outreach to the development industry so that we may remain involved and informed throughout the ordinance revision process. Thank you very much. Felwina followed by Paul. Good afternoon, council members and mayor. My name is Falwina Apisa Mundina, resident of District 5. I'm part of the Santa Clara Wage Theft Coalition and a member of the Filipino Association of Workers and Immigrants, OPAWIS. I'm here to support council members Davis, Jimenez, Torres, Ortez, and Foley memo in favor of the passing of a responsible construction ordinance that holds wage theft perpetrators accountable and empowers workers of their rights. It's been five years since the horrors of Silvery Towers was brought to, brought to light 
However, the RCO in San Jose has yet to be passed when other cities in the county have answered the call and have passed their own RCOs. We would like to thank the City Council. Rally or Rally M. We would like to thank the City Council, though, for continuing to push forward the RCO as manifested in the December City Council vote, moving forward with, with, with the RCO so that workers victimized by wage theft would be empowered to get back their stolen wages. However, the January 12 new proposal risks turning the RCO into a sham law with its broad loopholes allowing exploitative contractors to commit wage theft with impunity. Clearly, these deceptive changes arise from the lobbying by a few well-connected wealthy developers. Thus, I support a fair compromise as outlined in the memo of Council Members Davis Jimenez, Torres Ortiz, Ortiz and Foley, addressing questions about compliance while answering but while ensuring that perpetrators of wage theft are held accountable. Thank you. Paul, followed by David. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I'm reading El Plan del Deleno, and this document was read before the 250-mile trek from Deleno to Sacramento in 1965. I'm reading number two. It says that we seek support of all political groups and protections of the government which is also our government in our struggle. For too many years, we have been treated like the lowest of the low. Our wages and working conditions have been determined from above because irresponsible legislators who could have helped us have supported the ranchers' agreements and arguments that the plight of a farm worker was a special case. They say the obvious effects of an unjust system, starvation wages, contractors, day hauls, forced migration, sickness, illiteracy, camps and subhuman living conditions and acted as if they were irredeemable causes. The farm worker has been abandoned to his own fate without representation, without power, subject to mercy and caprice of the rancher. We are tired of words, of betrayals, of indifference. To the politicians, we say that the years are gone when the farm worker said nothing and did nothing to help himself. From this moment shall spring leaders who shall understand us, lead us, be faithful to us, and we shall elect them to represent us. We shall be heard. Now, this was written before the march, and we are still, this is written in 1965. We are still contending with this. It was a disgusting fact when I heard a council member say that they, before they uh, judge on justice, they needed to check with their bankers and they needed to check with their developers first. Justice delayed is justice denied. And that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about justice. Viva la causa. David, followed by Mundo A U A. Hello. Hi, Council. Uh, my name is David Padilla uh, with SAU 521, uh, Santa Clara County Workers. Um, and today I'm calling in to support and stand in support of the, um, the resolution before you. Um, just wanted to share that this is uh, something that county workers stand in full, fully in support of, um, letting bad actors get away which, with wage theft. Harms are many um, workers, uh, primarily impacting workers of color, immigrants and working uh, women. We need to do much better in our city to protect and empower working people, to uplift responsible businesses who pay their workers fairly, and to prevent and prosecute wage theft. I urge you to vote to enact the Responsible Construction Ordinance without delay and to support the memo from Council Members Ortiz, Torres, Jimenez, and Davis that addresses businesses' concerns about compliance and um, and make sure that worker rights are respected. So, thank you. Mundo UA Local 393, followed by David. Good evening, Mayor Mahan and City Council. Thank you for your time and attention here today. My name is Mundo Escarcega. I'm a representative for UA Local 393. We're over 3,100 plumbers, pipe fitters, steam fitters, and HVACR service technicians. We work in Santa Clara and San Benito County. I'm also a, life, a lifetime resident of San Jose. I'm here to ask for your votes and support of the memo of council members Davis, Ortiz, Torres, Foley, and Jimenez. 
It's important that we have help policies to protect people when they're at work. I've been on construction sites for over 30 years, and I've seen that there are potential hazards all around just from the nature of building. It's important that the contractors doing these jobs not cut corners at the expense of safety. People should have a safe place to work. Low paying contractors have worked in this area and have had workers die due to unsafe conditions. Case in point, Silvery Towers, which is known worldwide as Slavery Towers, not only for the deaths, but also for the people that were forced to live in storage containers. This is a mark on our city. I know San Jose has better to offer the community, and that is why I ask for your support in this memo. Thank you. David, followed by Scott. Moving on to Scott, followed by Chris. Thank you, um, Mayor, City Council. Thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Scott Reese, uh, born and raised in San Jose. I'm currently a business agent for UA Local 393 the plumbers, pipe fitters, steam fitters, HB, ACR technicians. Um, I just wanted to talk a little about it, a little bit about when I was a, a younger man, uh, I was actually a victim of wage theft, um, where when I was barely making anything as, as, a, as a kid, uh, it's hard enough when you can't even get your paycheck right. So I'm just here to speak in, in, in full support and vote for the memo, uh, the memo, excuse me, uh, Council Members Davis, Ortiz, Torres, Foley, Jimenez. Thank you. Chris? Oh, thank you, uh, Mayor Mahan and members of the Council. My name is Chris Smith, and I'm here speaking on behalf of the Associated General Contractors of California. Uh, AGC, we represent approximately 1,000 prime specialty and associate contractors throughout the state, and we're here to speak on the proposed uh, responsible construction ordinance this ordinance, as initially written, would have threatened long sought after development goals uh, by implementing unfair and unnecessary requirements on contractors and developers that had no involvement with wage theft. Uh, as written, the ordinance would have delayed uh, the certificate of occupancy transfer, um, and it would also made the prime contractor liable under penalty of perjury for investigating and verifying unspecified wage theft determinations well outside the bounds of a specific project. We appreciate the mayor and council uh, meeting with us and members uh, regarding our concerns uh, and efforts to mitigate those issues. We believe a lot of progress has been made uh, on this ordinance, specifically with the amendment uh, proposed by council members Davis, Jimenez, Torres, Ortiz, and Foley. Um, however, we do still have a few lingering concerns. Um, the contractor community would like to see the city of San Jose ensure the terminology wage theft um, reference the appropriate California law related to, uh, to actual wage theft and not things that are classified as wage misclassification. Uh, subsequently, our members uh, would like the clarity on how far down the trade partner and vendor chain uh, this ordinance goes and what is the city's ability to monitor that. And then lastly, um, we would like the enforcing entity to be the city of San Jose's building department uh, as they are the uh, most qualified to understand the requirements for private development. Uh, with this, these issues addressed, as well as the Proposed uh, amendments. Um, we think this uh, is a workable compromise. So, thank you on behalf of the Associated General Contractors for engaging on this. Back to Council. Thank you. I want to thank all the members of the public who came out and shared your perspectives with us about this uh, important issue. I uh, also want to thank my colleagues for having the wisdom to slow down. There's a lot of pressure to move quickly after what had been years of wait, and I fully appreciate that sense of urgency, but I also am very grateful to all of you for being willing to take a little more time to make sure we really engaged in stakeholder outreach and engagement and work to bring people together and make the proposed policy better. That leads to my final thank you, which is to council member Davis in particular, and I know she worked with her whole Brown Act, but um, really clearly just from reading the memo, I was not in her Brown Act, but clearly did a stellar job of bringing folks together, thinking through trade-offs and coming forward with something that's balanced, reasonable, clear, and, and clearly has broad support from both the development and labor uh, communities here. So um, thank you for your leadership on this, Councilmember Davis, and I'll turn to you. 
Thank you, Mayor. Uh, firstly, I want to thank staff for taking the time to dig into this issue and, and really doing more outreach. We are proud in the city of our inclusive approach to policy making, and I, I hope that this will persist going forward as was requested by many who came out. Uh, secondly, I want to thank everyone who uh, submitted public comment today, uh, especially for those of you who took the time to come here. I know it's uh, always a little bit of an inconvenience to come in the middle of the day or at the end of the day and wait for a long time to speak, especially when it's a work day. So thank you for coming out and, and showing your support and, and really talking about how this will impact, impact you and your industry. Um, for staff, I have a couple of questions that were brought up in the public comment, so I want to discuss them, especially as it relates to the memo that my colleagues and I drafted, because that's what I'm going to be moving. <laughs> Um, first of all, the, the materiality threshold. So in the original ordinance, there was a discussion in a couple of parts about $100,000 or 1% of the project, whichever is greater for the contractors or subcontractors. Um, this question is for, I think for Matt, but this might be for um, PBCE, for Chris Burton. What's your interpretation of who this would apply to? So, administrate. So the way we're separating this is obviously Chris's group is the one that is the building official, and then and it would be the operating group putting out um, the ordinance in terms of the workload. But we do the uh, the way we've proposed it. Uh, our group does the labor enforcement for the city, and so in this aspect, as in terms of a threshold. Um, the developer or contractor, essentially the permit applicant is the one that will be attesting to the size of the work that the person is, that the firm or entity is doing. And so they're attesting to it. We had, we had not envisioned a plan or have the resources to validate all of that valuation. Um, Chris could enlighten how valuations are generally done, but in terms of, in terms of administratively, the intention was that we would not be cross-checking every validation for every contractor. Does that answer that portion of the question? Yes. Chris, did you want to add something? No, I, I think Matt covered it. Obviously, we, we use valuation in the building permit process to uh, assess construction taxes, um, but that's a separate process uh, apart from that, and that looks at total project valuation, not by contractor, so it wouldn't necessarily fit in with this proposal. But that, that valuation can be used for the 1% of the project calculation. So it's $100,000 or 1% of the project, whichever is greater. That's the materiality threshold that we refer to in our memo that was in the original ordinance in a couple of spots. So we had not envisioned anything additional in terms of a separate valuation process. If there's a valuation that's going in through to PPCE, right. there would not be anything different than that. OK, great. So that's the, easy. The only question would then be timing, because obviously we do the valuation at the end of the process prior to issuance of permit as we do final fees. So we just have to figure out the logistics around that. Okay, thank you. So that's another issue that does need to be worked out um, through, the, through the ordinance process. Yeah. So as we return with the ordinance documents, Chris and I will meet and we'll discuss what a recommendation would be and then ordinance would work for the city attorney's office, what things um, match in with the best way to pull that off. Okay, thank you. And you touched on this, Matt, um, the role of PVCE versus uh, the role of the Department of Public Works. And I, I just want to um, make sure I understand. So when when there was a request for a PBCE to be involved in this, if that was the if that was the desire and the request um, by, by us, if I was to make that motion or make that part of my motion, Chris, what would that entail? Um, I think, you know, part of the challenge with this is you have to think about which part of this process. It's a multi-pronged process. Obviously, we'll be involved with the collection of the attestation on the upfront process as part of either the application or the issuance process through the building permit. As far as then as a complaint comes in, uh, that's not something that we're resourced for or that we have the skill set for. Um, you know, obviously, Matt's team is available and ready to do that, so we wouldn't look at that process at all. Thank you. So, I think... Um what I heard you say between the lines was if, if PBCE needed to do it, you would need more staff and that would increase your fees. Is that correct? 
Uh, yes, if this was intended to be a part of the fee program, yeah. Right. I mean, we would have to replicate staff that already exists in the Public Works Department, yeah. and that would be borne by applicants, correct? Right. That's why I'm not interested in adding that, just for anyone who wanted to make that request. Um, <laughs> I, I also want to thank um, all of the developers, contractors, and, and labor groups uh, who came together to work out a solution to, frankly, the problem of, of bad actors. And we heard about the worst actor, and thankfully they're in federal prison now. Um, but, but there are other bad actors in the construction industry, and we still need to ensure that construction can continue, or at least in many cases resume in San Jose as market conditions allow, especially to be able to, re to address our housing shortage. And so very grateful for people coming to the table and having those conversations with me and with staff um, as, as we've worked in the last couple of weeks to, to really hone in on, on, on a compromise. And I just want to um, mention that I heard repeatedly from developers and contractors that they want to work with people who are responsible and who follow the law because they are committed to paying, um, paying their workers fairly and ensuring that workers on their jobs get paid. Uh, so the memo submitted by myself and council members Jimenez, Torres, Ortiz, and Foley really lays out a structure, I think, that helps ensure that everyone on a project knows that they're working with businesses that treat workers fairly. And um, the question about the final certificate of occupancy as a consequence, we really needed to get at the worst of the worst, those who would have a conscious disregard for the ordinance and that there would be a consequence for that. The developers and the contractors that I talked to were not, are not worried about that consequence because they know that they can make the attestation and they can have a, a place to ensure that they're hiring contractors that are not on a list that hasn't, um, and that haven't satisfied any unpaid wage theft judgments against them. So we really had to have that so that there is a consequence for those who, who have a disregard. With that, um, I want to move the memo authored by myself. I'm moving the memo authored by myself and council members Jimenez, Torres, Ortiz, and Foley, and, I want to, and I'm directing the city manager to return to city council with a responsible construction ordinance that modifies the proposed ordinance as we've discussed in our memo with the understanding that outreach with stakeholders as the ordinance gets drafted um, will continue. Second. Thank you. Thanks, Councilmember. Councilmember from Dewan, appreciate it. Uh, Councilmember Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I had turned on my microphone earlier, Pam. That's why I, I got pushed back in, in, in line. I had, to I had a special <laughs> request <laughs> due to a, due a no technical yeah, issue. Yeah. No, no, yeah. no worries, no worries. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, and I want to th begin my comments by thanking our public works team. Well, really, this combination of staff leadership uh, who've come together um, to work tirelessly to ensure a strong and, and fair uh, ordinance. Um, likewise, I share my uh, thanks to my council colleagues who made up the BA group. Uh, I really want to thank uh, council member Deb Davis, who has been able to reach across the aisle several times now and work collaboratively um, to make sure that we are passing good policy, um, taking, in, taking input from both labor and, and industry, who all shared their feedback um, in, in order to move us forward today. Uh, as the critical need for housing drives construction in, in San Jose, we need to ensure that the laborers at the forefront of these projects are protected and paid on, on time. Wage theft is estimated to be, to be by far the most prevalent form of property crime in the United States. This fact is known, but enforcement is often all too absent, leading to the exploitation of some of the most vulnerable workers in our city. And while there are some bad actors who are out there uh, who may disagree with this policy, it's reassuring to know that we are here with indus industry leaders and labor standing together against this injustice um, in order to pass this memo. That's why I'm grateful that we've been able to reach an agreement um, with both sides of the aisle, um, which marks a new chapter for the city of San Jose. Uh, the memo authored by our Brown Act um, threads this needle and signals that regardless of position, uh, nationality, or immigration status, everyone deserves to 
be paid a fair wage and a timely wage. Uh, so I look forward to, to addressing these injustices and, and making sure that we are continuing to build an equitable San Jose. Uh, I do just want to you know, share some comments based on a public comment. Um, I just want to share with the public that as council members, you know, we do not give up um, our ability to protest, to participate in activism. And I just want to reassure the community um, that if you are an employer, whether you're a, a grocery store, a school district, a fast food restaurant, or a construction company, if you have worker disputes and those workers come to me and say that there are allegations of wage theft or discrimination, I'm going to back those workers and show up at a picket line. Uh, and I don't care what district that's in. I don't care what that city that is. I mean, hey, if it's the weekend, I'm happy to jump on a bus and go to a different state. But I want to reassure working people in the city of San Jose that they have an ally in me, and I will not be intimidated by anyone. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Foley. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank everyone, uh, the members of the public who spoke, either virtually or in person. Thank you for being here and sharing your uh, stories and your support of the memo that we have crafted under the leadership of Council Member Davis. I also would like to thank the labor and development communities for their input. Their collaboration was key to finding a path forward that will keep workers safe from wage theft without creating additional roadblocks for our construction community. I'd like to thank my colleague, Councilman De Dev Davis, for her true leadership in reaching across the aisle, her extraordinary work in bringing both sides together for a compromise all stakeholders can accept. Wage theft in any form is not acceptable in our city, and I know that all of my colleagues would agree with that. But we also make sure, need to make sure that any further barriers on the construction community is done so in collaboration with all stakeholders. Because when construction ends or ceases, then all of the workers who would benefit from that construction loses their jobs, and that's, that's something we need to prevent. When we can incorporate the input from all stakeholders and bring the community into the process, everyone wins and good policy is created. The letters of support from both stakeholders within the labor and the development communities is rare and something we should embrace. And I will be supporting the memo written by Council Member Davis, actually led by Council Member Davis, and my other council colleagues, Jimenez, Torres, and Ortiz. Thank you. Great, thank you, Council Member. Appreciate your work on this as well. Council Member Torres. Great, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to our, to our city staff for bringing everybody together to make sure that uh, we have an ordinance where everybody is happy. Uh, and of course, uh, thank you to Council Member Davis, for, Davis for, for gathering you know, folks across the aisle to, to make sure that it also happens, right? Because you know, for a policy to pass here in the city of San Jose, you need six votes and sometimes you need uh, progressives and you need moderates and you need conservatives to, to make things happen, right? And so uh, this memo does that. The memo put forth from myself and, and my colleagues, Council Member Ortiz, Council Member Jimenez, and Council Member Foley, right, was done with col collaboration with both our developers, our, our labor unions, and other stakeholders as well here in our city. And I know we are seeing a upswing in downtown San Jose amongst our small business community, right, and our thriving arts community, right, but as a downtown council member, I definitely want to see more cranes from my office, right, because that symbolizes growth and it symbolizes progress, right, and together we can get those cranes up, right. We need a healthy ecosystem here in our city where our developers can build beautiful housing projects or office towers once they come back to work. I hope office workers come back to work, right? While the folks building those project, projects have protections for a fair pay and or wage, 
So again, together it takes all of us to continue to grow. And our memo outlines that we can develop responsibly and that if we have bad actors who do commit wage theft, they understand that we are watching and that we will not allow it here in the city of San Jose because everyone deserves to, to get paid a fair wage or gets paid entirely what they're owed uh, for a hard day's work. So um, thank you. And uh, with that, I actually do have a question before uh, I, I yield my time. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure who, who can answer this question, uh, but um, is, there, is there a reason why this ordinance um, is not overseen by PVCE, um, but I do know, we do know that the purview is public works for wage theft, right? But is there a reason why uh, we're not having this ordinance over, overseen or the purview of PVCE? So even, even though I did hear the, the statistics and, on our vacancy with PVCE and it was really scary, but <laughs> this is just a question, of course, right? Yeah, it's not, not, a, it's not, not a part memo, of this. Not a, not a, not a motion for, for, for policy, but yeah, just a question. Yeah, it's not because of the scary vacancies that we all are experiencing, not just Chris. Um, so Chris's team in our Office of Quality Assurance does labor enforcement across all the departments in the city. Um, we also do labor enforcement for minimum wage in the, in the private sector for multiple cities. We also enforce it there. Quite frankly, it's just that's where the professional staff is located that has the expertise to review and understand the documents that come through. It's the most efficient way to do it is for, uh, in terms of reviewing the labor or the complaints that come in. As in terms of nothing's touching the building official's role and responsibilities or, or the ownership of that. It's more of just the review of these the, the, any complaints that come in. That's it. Okay. Um, We'll, we'll definitely have more conversations offline about that, but it's, it's, I'm still a little bit intrigued on, on, um, on, this, on this matter, on this issue, obviously. Um, but we'll continue to have communication. I know there's a lot of folks who want to speak, and I know folks have been waiting for hours to, to, to speak on this item, and I hope to vote on it, just like the rest of our, my colleagues will. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Appreciate that. Council Member Candelas. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mayor. I, I, I too want to add on to the to the thanks, not just for the folks who came and took time out of your day to come out and provide comment, but also to city staff, especially uh, in, in in engaging with the important dialogue this last month uh, with our key stakeholders. I know uh, we all know this process started a couple years ago, and um, and this is a commitment to ultimately protecting the rights of our workers and ensuring that they are shield, shielded from uh, dishonest contractors who seek exploitation, we're all on the same page. There's no question that our, our community does not and will not um, tolerate uh, wage theft here in our city. Um, our commitment to development must be uh, paralleled by a dedication to the well-being of our workers who contribute to the growth of our city. Um, I've heard that loud and clear. Um, I also believe that there are places for improvements and opportunities. Um, to, you know, reducing red tape and permitting and, and trying to look uh, internally as well. Um, uh, and and I, I want to uh, challenge City Hall staff and also my colleagues to see how we can think about this going forward. I, I know there's many challenges uh, within the building, but also things outside of, the city, uh, outside of City Hall, the capital markets, uh, just the sheer cost of materials, um, and, and, and also things like, you know, folks who are, who are weaponizing CEQA to gum up the process. Um, and, 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 and all these things, I just hope that we continue to engage our, our key stakeholders, labor, folks in development, um, on these efficiencies. And, and, and I, you know, that being said, I, I, I want to end on a, on a positive note. I want to thank uh, Council Member Davis for her leadership with her Brown Act. Um, Council Members Ortiz, Torres, Foley, and Jimenez um, on, on coming up with a, a a balanced compromise, um, and um, and you know uh, ultimately, I'm pretty sure this is probably going to be end up, end up unanimous. So it's a testament to to your work, um, and so um, you know I, I think every worker deserves deserves fair compensation for the work that they perform, and and it's our collective responsibility to to ensure that um, their rights are protected and that our city flourishes. Um, so thank you. Great, thanks for those comments, Council Member Council Member Batra. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on this thing. Uh, 
On January 12th, when we had the proposed ordinance, everybody agreed that that ordinance was addressing a very important need. Um, we want to make sure that the workers have the confidence, not only that they will get paid, that there will be nobody doing a wage theft. So when they come into the work, they can peacefully work on it and rest at the end of the day, that their fair work will get paid fairly. But it was also obvious that that ordinance has been drafted and the one side, the important other side, had not been consulted enough. And hence, the proposed ordinance really only addressed part of the needs and it did not allow to have the developer community be able to really do any development, which would hurt because there would be no jobs for anybody to work on if the developers can do the development here. So I think taking the time from the 12th of January to moving this thing has really been helpful and the outreach which has been done and the Deb Davis bringing up the two parties together, two sides together, not two parties, uh, two big parties over there. So thank you very much for that. And as we heard, that everybody on, the, on both sides of the story is very happy with it, that we are going to have the ordinance, which is going to protect the wages, which we do want to. And at the same time, we are not going to be shortchanging our developers and they will be able to develop otherwise we would not have, have any housing here or any commercial projects here. So it's a great compromise which has been done and a sensible ordinance. I am concerned a bit about the fact that when I looked at the stats, it was shown that about 12,000 cases in 10, 15 years of the wage theft, but there was no breakdown whether those wage theft occurred before uh, over 10,000 square feet projects or below that one. I hope that this thing does not leave a big gap where the people who are really cheating on the system, they get escape. And the ones who were already complying with the things, they continue to be observing this ordinance and yes, we'll be more confident, our workers will be confident that they would not have the weight theft, but we would not have caught the real people who were actually doing the wage theft. So that would be one concern of mine uh, that I think we should really look at the opportunity to extend this thing when it is appropriate or at least analyze that where the weight theft was occurring even though we are going to move forward with the ordinance. And the second part, which has already been commented, I'd like to add to it is, yes, this thing has demonstrated that when we consult all parties involved, we can come up with a great resolution and a great ordinance. So we should continue to do that and in the haste, not try to just ignore one side or the other or give less importance to one or the other. So that would be both a request or a continuation of the activity we're talking about. And uh, in fact, I would say congratulations on coming up with this ordinance and uh, what certainly will be supporting it uh, with our vote. Thank you. Thank you, council member, vice mayor Kmet. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll be short because a lot of has already been said um, and I'd like to also uh, thank uh, my colleague, Councilmember Davis, for her leadership and my council uh, colleagues who uh, brought this forward. Uh, you know, six years is a long time to wait, and I think that we've come to a good place. Uh, wage theft is a crime, uh, and I think that none of us want to see that. Uh, I do want to point out that um, uh, as, as far as I understand, there is wage theft also in the 10,000 uh, square feet and below. And I think that as we move forward, um, it would be, it would be uh, helpful for us to remain vigilant. 
I also have heard stories about exploitation of youth and youth coming in needing to work and um, being exploited by um, smaller jobs and contractors. So I think that that's an issue for another time, but I do think that as this move moves forward, um, it would be something that uh, would be of interest to uh, take a look at. Um, I wanna thank everyone who came and, and shared their thoughts on this. And I, I just wanna say, Mr. Bailey, who spoke today, is right. We need to take care of our people. We really do. This is really important. Wage theft is a serious thing, and there's a lot, a lot of fear uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the individuals who are faced with some of these things. Uh, many underreported, and I think that um, this will be a, a great step to move forward. I want to thank staff for all the work going back and forth and meeting at any time. <laughs> so uh, I know that uh, it was uh, not easy, but I look forward to the ordinance uh, moving forward. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Councilman Dwan. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I was jokingly with uh, Council Member <coughs> that if she get her name mentioned again, she'll, get, she'll have enough money. For every single time her name is mentioned, she'll have enough money for a coffee a whole month. <laughs> and, and, uh, and bravo, thank you for taking the leadership that with the collaboration, leech, uh, reaching out to business and, and, and labor unions to come up with this uh, presidential um, ordinance uh, that that needs to protect all the workers, right? But somewhere, I believe that we need to protect all the workers, including under 10,000 square feet. Because I've, I've gone out there and talked to workers, and 80, I believe that there's a stat out there somewhere, there's a study, that 80% of the violation is under 10 and 15,000 square feet. And those workers out there are suffering tremendously. And I do have a question for staff that can you explain to our public the reason why we didn't go below the 10,000 mark uh, to protect the rest of the worker? Thank you for the question. I think there's three answers to that. One, we were directed on December, on December 12th to include one that came back with 10,000 square feet. Um, that's the, the number one reason why that number was chosen. If you remember, our original ordinance said 15,000 square feet as the floor, as I'm describing it in terms of projects. The type of work that we're looking at in terms of below 10,000 feet could impact small businesses and or residential modifications that would trigger a lot more permit breadth that also have different administrative closure processes other than these larger, more sophisticated projects. And if we're going to develop the systems, the third piece, the systems in which to monitor it, monitor the, and to officiate it efficiently, um, we should build it at the 10,000 square foot level, understand it, review it, see if it's effective, and if need be, modify it in the future. So, the, the bottom line is it will be a lot more work. You would need to hire more resource, right? I don't know that uh, we would probably need to hire more resources. I don't know a lot more work because I don't know that the definition of the measure from the beginning to the end in terms of how much more work. Um, it definitely would be more because more permits are included in once you go below, below 10,000 square feet. On average, San Jose over the last five years issues about 100 permits that are at 10,000 square feet and larger. And so that volume does not seem something like we need to add staff to, to administer. Um, below that, we'd have to evaluate what that would mean and, and report back what those impacts would be. A lot of homes are being built now less than 2,500 square feet. And so there's a lot of contractor out there are, are, are working and therefore there's a lot more wage theft for all contractor underneath 10,000 square feet. So somewhere, I believe that if we have all the resources and the finance, that we need to protect all workers, right? Not, not above 15,000. 
And I'm glad that, you know, the, the Silvery Towers incident is come to fruition where the guys end up in, in, in prison, and rightly so. But there's a lot of contractor out there right now is violating these laws. And I think that even if, if there's a permit to install um, a water heater, I think that contractor should sign an affidavit or at least a checkbox and say, hey, I don't have any wage theft against me. And, and those are simple things I think that we need to do more. But I am grateful that staff have, and, and uh, Council Member Davis leading this, and staff have reached out to, to all um, you know, uh, players in collaboration to come with this ordinance. And um, I just want to thank you, and, and we'll continue to work to protect all workers. Great. Thank you, council member. Um, also, thank you again to city staff for all the work you've done and helping to facilitate this. I think we've all, um, hopefully now to Councilor Davis's point, really can come to appreciate how important it is to do that very robust stakeholder engagement, that inclusive policy making process Councilor spoke about. I'm glad we are able to take action in what it sounds like maybe a unanimous vote here that both sends a clear message that wage theft will not be tolerated in San Jose, it's against the law, folks will be prosecuted and you will not be welcome to do business here. And we're gonna do it in a way that has support from the development community and does not punish those who are good actors or push out the investment we desperately need in jobs and housing. So I think we've struck a very good balance here. Appreciate the work of my colleagues. I think we're ready to vote. Motion passes unanimously. Wonderful. Okay, good job everybody. We are at 540. I would like to get through the regular agenda before the study session. I know it was agendized as breaking it up in the middle. There's a lot of transition cost for our uh, technical team here. The question though will be at what point we want to stop for dinner. How do folks feel about maybe getting into our first land use item and then potentially pausing for dinner at some point? Mayor. I I'm sorry? I believe the land use items are noticed for 6 p.m. Oh, well then why don't we break for dinner until 6.10? How's that for everybody? Dinner's already ordered. We'll do dinner until 6.10 and then we're gonna continue with land use to get through the regular agenda first. So we are on recess for dinner until 6.10. Thank you.